begin, before we begin the regular meeting, we have a public comment session and uh, we have a sign up sheet. Uh, I'll ask the folks to step forward and state their name and address uh, for the record. And you'll see uh, over my shoulder there's a three minute timer to keep the time, and we would ask folks to uh, respect that time limit. Uh, uh, so the first speaker who has signed up this evening is Peter Blanchett. Good evening. Um, I wish to state that I'm a resident interested in the good government of Northampton, and I'm at best confused and at worst alienated by my experience over the past 16 months as a neighbor of the Montview Conservation Land. Becoming involved with a community input process starting at the grassroot level and later taken up by the OPD with issues concerning the lovely public land next to my home. This experience was nothing I sought out. I was invited to a neighborhood meeting by the then license holders where a discussion was to take place with neighbors about changes they were proposing in their future planned use of the land. I can't be sure about every person at that meeting, but I'm fairly certain that like me, most of the neighbors there had been enthusiastic supporters of the Montview neighborhood farm. Most of us as shareholders, literally putting our money where our mouths are to support the imaginative vision of locally grown and consumed food and in the case of my family, hosting the distribution of shares on our lawn. Unfortunately, the changes proposed by the then license holders were not acceptable to the clear majority of neighbors, and parts of the proposal looked to be in violation of the original agreements made between the neighbors, the license holders, and OPD. This has since been confirmed in CONSCOM meetings. But going forward at that time, the first meeting, I thought we were about to undertake a mutual process whereby we and the then license holders would figure this all out. I can honor differences in opinion, especially when there's a structure in place to manage it. I mention this because I find it instructive that during what has become somewhat of a melee in the struggle to find out what administrative support the OPD and CONSCOM would give to a group of deeply sincere citizens who obviously care about the land in question, as evidenced by afternoons and evenings spent meeting, postering, inviting people for hours, door to door, to come and discuss the future direction of the land. What support would the city, through its OPD and CONSCOM, give to us to make sure that the land is well stewarded for this urban transition environment? I learned two things. One, when you try to get to the bottom of something, to find legal documents, official guidance, and statements of intentions, the things that delineate the uses and practices agreed upon by the responsible parties, you will not get to the bottom of anything. The suppositions we have proceeded on, the leases, licenses, MOUs, CRs, for someone like me, they all just recede into a gray haze of business left undone and power passively and opaquely used, concentrated in the OPD and Conservation Commission, which operates at a level of communication and function of a Soviet-era artist supply store. And by that, I mean, yes, we have brushes. No, you can't buy any brushes. Yes, we have easels. No, you can't buy an easel. We still don't even know if there is or was a lease in 2008 on the Montview land. If the CR agreed upon years ago and left unimplemented, will be implemented, or was never really intended to be. So the passions around land use are strong. Oh, my time is up. So I just uh, thank you for taking my comments. Do you want to submit the full statement and we can make sure councillors get a copy of it? Thank you very much, Mr. Yeah. Mayor. Yeah, so if you want to um, just hand that to one of the councillors and we'll make sure the full copy gets distributed. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> the next speaker is Madeline Weaver Blanchett. Hi, I'm Madeline Weaver Blanchett. I live at 41 Valley Street. Agendas of meeting for the Conservation Commission are not accurately posted. For the May 24th meeting, an agenda without mention of Montview Conservation Land was posted on the Commission's webpage, but an agenda that included Montview was posted in City Hall. This had the effect of discouraging all of Montview's neighbors, myself included, from attending and participating in what turned out to be a nearly hour-long discussion of Montview and where the Commission ultimately reversed its previous decision on the land's management. The relationship between the Commission and OPD is confusing and inconsistent. Nearly a year ago, OPD invited neighbors to collaborate in the stewardship of Montview. Since then, the Commission has vacillated and reversed itself in defining that relationship to such an extent that hundreds of hours of citizen volunteer time has been wasted soliciting community opinion, holding meetings and drafting RFPs, MOUs, and CRs, documents that the Commission has reacted to with a range from confusion to contempt. 
Decisions and conduct of both bodies appear ungrounded in statutes or regulations. Despite numerous respectful requests by neighbors, neither OPD nor the Commission can adequately explain why the conservation restriction that went along with the original deed transfer that created the Montview Conservation Land and guaranteed participation by neighbors in its management was never filed and why no one can produce a signed copy of the most recent license that granted a group of private citizens the right to garden a portion of the land for three years. Most recently, at the May 24th meeting with the agenda problem, in flagrant disregard of OPD, who had stated at a January 6th meeting that none of those former licensees would be eligible to bid on an RFP to continue use of the land because of repeated license violations, the Commission decided to continue to allow the primary licensee to garden there six months after her license, if there ever was one, had expired. Not surprisingly, it was she alone who attended the meeting. Not surprisingly, again, the Commission failed to issue an RFP to allow any other farmer to submit proposals for working on the free public land, flip-flopping on the core value of open competitive public process. The Commission does not include letters by citizens in their meeting minutes, minutes which lack details. No meetings, uh, no minutes since March are on the website. In 2012, the Commission could have met 10 times on the second and fourth Thursdays. Instead, it has met six <coughs> times. The average attendance at those meetings by commissioners is 59 percent, with five times commissioners leaving early and once the vice chair, who was chairing the meeting in the absence of the chair, arriving 25 minutes late. These lapses create significantly disjointed and dysfunctional process whereby <coughs> citizens who are following an issue are often confronted with an entirely different panel at each meeting and the panel appeals to peers to have no information or knowledge of discussions or decisions made at other meetings. Tellingly, at the May 24th meeting, which NCTV thankfully recorded, one of the commissioners mentions that he has not been able to attend a meeting since February, but there were no meetings in February for lack of a quorum. In conclusion, all of these problems contribute to the Commission shutting down reasonable citizen participation and appearing arbitrary and capricious in both procedure and substantive decision making. Thank you. The next speaker is Henry Kowalski. Hi, I'm Henry Kowalski, and I live at 35 Fatfield Street in Northampton. And uh, first, I would like to thank the mayor and the council for the work they're doing here in the city of Northampton, trying to make it run. All I can say, lots of luck to you. I'm here because a couple of weeks ago, I read an article in the paper, and it disturbed me very much about how the city hands out time. I forgot the word already. The, what do we call it? Comp, comp time. Comp. Why should I forget that? Comp time. I understood at my job where I work, comp time was given to somebody that was not salary paid. They were hourly paid. And if it was something that had to be done in emergency or something, they would get comp time. But in the meantime, you do not keep that money and get a thousand hours added onto it. Since 2006, and we've been in there for five years. So that means from 06 to 05, that probably was a little bit of a of a work time there, but it opened up because we're going to be celebrating our fifth anniversary come October, I think. Or, but. So I'm a little bit upset about that, and it's been annoying me, and I like to get the word out. So I just wish that this comp time is used the way it's supposed to be used. None of this time was documented. How can it be legal if it's not documented? I know when I worked, we used comp time. We had to document everything, what, where we did, and what we did. Now, if it comes to policemen, fire department, now that's a different story. That has something to do with security. This has nothing to do with security. And I want to thank all the volunteers that work over there. They put a lot of work in there. I've been volunteering there for about 13 years when we were over here at Memorial, Memorial Building over here. And I am just disgusted with it. It makes me sick 
So I felt so bad after six years being on the board, I resigned last week. And that's the way I feel about the situation. I wish the counselors would think about this. I know the budget time is coming. City has to raise taxes on the water. Now, there's other taxes. When we, uh, it's about time, hey, listen, I want to thank you, but that's the way I feel about it. I wish you'd investigate this and look into it. Hey, thank you. Mr. Kowalski. The next speaker is Mac Everett. I am Mac Everett. Thank you for the opportunity to speak before you. Uh, I live at 40 Valley Street in Northampton. And I also am a neighbor uh, across from the Montview Conservation property that's already been talked about. And I actually appeared before the council in uh, 19, or rather 2000, when that land was donated by the Aquadro family. And we urged you to accept that donation. And it was, we rejoiced that you did. As you can see, there's been some problems, although most of the time that the land has been in the city's property, things have gone pretty smoothly. And um, I think I want to make one point about the problems. I think that they have stemmed from the fact that when the land was acquired and the deed transfer was to take place, there was supposed to be a conservation restriction placed upon the land. And uh, uh, in fact, one was written up, which I'm going to quote you here. Um, there's a quote under um, allowed acts and uses which says, subject to the availability and use by the general public within appropriate rules and regulations and only with the written agreement of all abutting property owners within 200 feet of said facility, utilization of the property for public outdoor recreational uses and for any other use not specifically prohibited in the above prohibited acts and uses. So our feeling is that the city built in a mechanism so that the, the abutters and the neighbors in this area would have some say in what was going, had significant say in what was going on. And I think that was designed in because you have to understand this is a very small piece of land in a very densely packed Ward 3 neighborhood. It's really kind of like a pocket park. And the neighbors, as soon, the problem is that this, this was never uh, affixed to the deed when the property transfer took place. And we were under the assumption that it was for many years. So the neighborhood has entered into some of these situations that have come up, the conflict situations, <coughs> with a sense of agency that then we were told didn't exist. So my request is that the city solicitor be um, brought into this conversation. And this document, which the council approved, according to what we've been told, the council approved, be re-examined and the implications of that clause be discussed more fully so that we have a clear sense of what our agency in this situation is. Um, I'd also just like to add, since I have a couple of more minutes, that the, the neighborhood has over the years rolled up its sleeves and done a great deal in terms of helping to maintain this property. People have done a lot of mowing. We leveled a play field that became a green space. We've developed paths through the conservation area. So there's been a tremendous amount of sweat equity. And I think um, people uh, are dedicated to this land and just want to be able to get a clear picture of what our role is supposed to be in it. Thank you very much. <coughs> the next speaker is Claudia Lefko. Claudia Lefko, 40 Valley Street. I'm here with part two. I was here a few weeks ago speaking about the Mother's Day Committee and said that we had met and I was, one of us would be going to the mayor's office to have a meeting with, to schedule a meeting. So I did go to the mayor's office and I was met with what I would call weary uh, hostility. Um, the city was broke, there were no staff people, you know, didn't blah, 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 and nothing could happen until the budget was done. So I felt a little bit annoyed by this, but this can wait. Nonetheless, city business goes on, even as the budget goes on. And I came to you previously to say, one of my issues has to do with the city's 
and the city government's inability to harness the energy of people in the community who are willing participants who want to be of help, like this man who's been working on the Council on Aging, for instance. And I said I thought it would be a good investment, better than an economic development person, to come up with some policies that would help people who want to get involved get involved, but get involved so that their work is valued and so that their expertise is valued and so their time is well spent, which brings me to the issue that everyone else in my neighborhood is talking about, which is the Conservation Commission. I live at 40 Valley Street and I've been involved in this parcel for many years as well. And we are completely frustrated by these meetings with the Conservation Committee. And I wrote actually Kevin Lake some emails about, um, about a detail, which doesn't need to concern any of you, but I carbon CC'd to David, to the mayor, and I got a little note back from Lynn saying, what is this about? You know, the mayor does not, what did she say? The mayor does not get involved in decisions, to the decision-making process of the Conservation Commission, and she sent me to the city clerk. So I guess my question is this. As you hear, we are a very frustrated group of people. There is, are things that we cannot answer, and the Conservation Commission and Wayne Fiden's office has not been forthcoming with the information we need. So who are, is responsible for this? Where are we to go with these problems? And I'm going to just close by saying I feel like I'm not a passive complainer. I've been very active in the city for some 30 years, ever since I lived here. I've worked on the outside. I've worked next to people in city government, and I've been in city government three times being elected at large on the school committee. And not to brag, but in those races, I was the top vote getter, even playing against one of the city's favorite politicians, uh, Dostel, Jim Dostel. So it's not like I am really have my pul hand on the pulse, but I think people in the city respond to this idea that we want to be part of government, but we don't find a way in. And so I'm here again pleading with you to please take this seriously. We need oversight. We need the committees that are set up to function well. We're here. We're ready. This is our city, and we want to be actively involved. Thank you. Thank you, Claudia. The next speaker is Rick Clark. Rick Clark, 84 William Street. I'm here also to speak about Montview Conservation Land. When I first bought my house in 98, it, it was in large part because of this field. It was a cornfield then, but often grew pumpkins and straw. It was beautiful. As a single father to a small boy, it was awesome that behind our house was this big field. And once we got rid of the bittersweet, there was a great view of the mountain range and the summit house. At night, in the spring, we loved the chorus of peepers. We'd see flocks of different birds come and go, landing on the changing water level, depending on what time of year. My son would play with the neighborhood kids there, fly kites, fetch sticks with our dog Champ. Soon, the land was for sale. The owner was a developer who wanted to build five or six big houses there. They even wanted to change the shape of the wetlands. But due only to these neighbors, many of whom are here today, in the end, this body approved and accepted the land as conservation land. Beautiful, accessible, open public space was preserved, and a conservation restriction would preserve it forever. This room, it was reported, you can look it up, erupted in applause, the great victory that these people, this small neighborhood, had achieved. Over five years of annual brush hogging, it became a beautiful grassland surrounding a small wetland with mowed playing field and paths all dutifully done by volunteer neighbors. Fast forward to 2005, a group of organic gardeners asked and were given stewardship of the land. In this time, Wayne Fiden has publicly stated that the license had been violated and this group announced it was going to leave the land. We were told and believed that it would be back up to the neighbors to once again steward the field. And we looked forward to seeing the land being restored to its former state as a grassland, as it was stipulated in the gardens, gardener's legal and signed license with the city. But that has not happened. The mismanaged gardeners are mostly gone. No one has been held to those terms of the license, and it's been devastating to watch this process happen. The Montview Open Meadow is now densely covered in weeds, invasives, and towering opportunistic species. The unique mountain and meadow vistas are heavily obscured by these dramatic changes in conditions. 
I hear fewer peepers. There are less migratory birds that land in the field. There is what is being referred to as a forest garden covering part of the land. There are predators spotted closer and closer to my house. The ever-growing shade, I feel, has caused the mosquito population to explode along the wetland. Public access is very limited. It makes me sad to see this land so divided and neglected. To say the least, I'm totally dismayed that the CONSCOM doesn't at all seem to care about the history of this land, the documents that inform it, or the neighbors who love it. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in the public comment? Okay. Um, uh, before I call to order the regular meeting of the City Council, I wanted to ask if the Council and the public here tonight, uh, if we could take a moment of silence uh, to um, honor 36-year uh, veteran Springfield Police Officer Kevin Ambrose, who was killed in the line of duty uh, this week. Um, while he was in a Northampton police officer, he, his uh, uh, courage and bravery every day on the streets is indicative of the work of police officers throughout the valley, throughout the country, including here in Northampton. So I wanted to just take a moment of silence in his honor. Thank you. And I would ask to call the, the clerk to call the roll of the regular meeting. Present. Present. Here. Here. Councilor Daniels? Here. Councilor Here. 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 I, I also just wanted to note for the record that uh, Councilor Jesse Adams is unable to attend tonight's meeting. Um, he is in Washington, D.C. Uh, for the swearing in of his brother as a Marine Lieutenant Colonel uh, at the Pentagon. So he could not be with us tonight, but we uh, congratulate his brother on that accomplishment and thank him for his service. The first order of business on your agenda is the approval of minutes of May 17th, May 8th, and May 9th. Move to approve. Second. Okay. Any discussion about those minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I have to abstain. I missed one of the meetings, the hearings, but you put them in a group. Okay. So that's, I'll abstain. Okay. Fine. Great. So those are uh, accepted. Uh, proclamations, resolutions, awards, and recognitions. We do not have any this evening. Are there any one-minute announcements from the councillors? Uh, Councillor Dwight? Uh, normally, I would save this for, uh, for I get my own special announcement period, but this is, uh, I just want to let everyone know that um, the next council meeting will convene at JFK Middle School, and that'll be the 21st, the meeting of the 21st uh, for the second reading of the budget. This is part of a, uh, a program that uh, that I had discussed with Mary Madura and then and with the mayor and with councils before, with an intent to try and have uh, you know at least six meetings during the year in in uh, in Leeds, so that uh, people who don't necessarily have access to downtown will have have the ability to go and attend meetings there and it seemed appropriate to split the first reading of the budget tonight and the second reading of the budget there so please uh, putting everyone on notice and, and inviting <coughs> everyone anyone who's interested in attending that the meeting will convene at the regular time of seven o'clock yeah uh, yes at seven o'clock at uh, JFK Middle School and that's in the community room on, on 100 Bridge Road for people who are trying to GPS it if they're so. Another one of the announcements. Council. Yeah, I'd like to, we, we've all heard uh, many people come to public comment talk about assessments and how property is sold for more than it was assessed for and some had sold for less and carried on and on and on and uh, it got pretty lively at some points. But uh, again, I just want to say that our assessor in the residential, commercial and industrial property values came in at 98% after the sales ratio studies were done, she leads the state in her expertise and precision. And last year she was actually given an award. She has a plaque hanging on her wall when she hit 99%. It's unheard of. I haven't got a clue what, but just a job well done to the assessor's office. That's for the Department of Revenue. Thank you. 
Mr. Freeman Daniels. Uh, thank you um, for uh, the Northampton Area Young Professionals, which is a, uh, a body of the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce, is having a uh, board fair for not for profits on June 13th. Anyone interested in uh, getting involved in a local uh, not for profit board, social organization, or so on uh, can go to the uh, Smith Convention Center, which is the former faculty club, 5 o'clock. Uh, and um, you can interact with, uh, uh, I think, maybe almost two dozen uh, different not-for-profits that are uh, that have open board seats and also need volunteers. Sorry, what was the date again on that? The 13th. Thank you. 5 p.m. Councilor. And, and I'm sorry, there's uh, a copy of the Massachusetts Department of Transportation notice uh, on uh, Project Chance or Change. Chance. Uh, for the Norwatic Rail Trail Improvement Project located in Amherst, Hadley, and Northampton. And the copy of this will be on file in the City Council That's for anyone who's interested. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay. Um, before we move on, I wanted to just for tonight's meeting appoint Councillors Tacey and Labarge to the Enrollment Committee for purposes of enrollment ordinances that are passed. The next item is appointments, elections, and public hearings. Okay. Um, and we have a reappointment. Um, uh, this is a reappointment of uh, Gary Hartwell, who currently serves on the Board of Public Works as the BPW's representative to the Transportation and Parking Commission, a term to expire uh, January of 2014. Um, move approval. Okay. Suspend. We probably need to suspend rules. <coughs> suspend rules of already. <coughs> sure. If, if he's the appointment from a committee to the planning board, I'm not sure that has ever come before yes, our committee. Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. the, the, the BPW the to the transportation. Right. right. I'm not sure that. We've we often brought it forward, but you, you okay. usually just honored it and said. Was there a second on your suspension? Yes. So there's been a, a motion to suspend Rule 30. 30. Uh, it's been seconded. Um, all those in favor of suspending rule say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So then, um, Councillor Freeman Daniels' motion to approve the appointment is in order. Is there a second? I'll second that. Okay. Um, is there any discussion? Uh, hearing none. All those in favor of approving say aye. 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 Okay. Great. Um, the next. May I suggest we take these as a group, unless any counselors have an objection to. Okay. I'll second the reappointment as a group. Okay. Um, I will read them just for the public. Yes. Uh, so the um, these are reappointments to city boards, committees, and commissions. Uh, the first is uh, Mary Clark, uh, reappointment to the Arts Council, term to expire uh, March 2015, and she'll be moving from a full member to an associate member. Uh, next is uh, Gaetan Fort Fortin. Uh, being reappointed to the Committee on Disabilities, term to expire August 2015. R. Downey Meyer, being reappointed to the Conservation Commission, term to expire March 2014. Uh, Lynn Wallace, uh, reappointed to the Housing Partnership, term to expire December 2013. Martha Acklesberg, term to uh, also being reappointed to the Housing Partnership, a term to expire December 2014. David Cronin being reappointed to the Recreation Commission, term to expire June 2014. Uh, so there's been a motion made and seconded. Uh, yes. And so you'd like to suspend Rule 30. So yes. there's a motion, motion made and seconded to suspend Rule 30. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. And so then um, I guess there's also been a motion to approve these, uh, or sort of doing these out of order, but made and Move seconded. Through. Um, Second. And uh, any discussion on these reappointments? Councilor. Yes, on um, Mary Clark. We had interviewed her, I think it was about two months ago. And the name looked very, very familiar. So I did talk in the mayor's office in regards to Mary. And we did approve her. And apparently there's some form of illness in the family, and that's why she's asking to be placed as an associate member. Okay. Um, 
Any other comments or questions? Okay, so all those in favor of these reappointments say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, the next is a new appointment uh, that, re that will re require referral. Uh, this is uh, Mi Nguyen of 16 Arnold Avenue, uh, appointment to the Tree Committee, a term to expire June 2015. Does entertain a motion to refer to? So the moved. Appointment? Second. Second it. Okay. Yeah. All those in favor of the motion to refer, say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so that will go to the Committee on Appointments and Evaluations. Um, before we recess for Finance Committee, there's been a request to move up our presentation uh, prior to Finance Committee. Mm -hmm. um, so with the Council's indulgence, I will uh, recognize our, our guests from the Veterans Council of Northampton to talk about Flag Day. So if you could just introduce yourself, Mr. Pease. And Mayor, members of the City Council, my name is Brad LeBay, and I am the President of the Veterans Council. Uh, Tom Pease is with me tonight. He's our Publicity Officer, and I also have Charlie Coleman with us. So I'm going to let them fellas take over and fill you in. Thank you. I live at 130 Spring Street in Florence, and I am the Public Relations Officer um, for the Veterans Council of Northampton. June the 14th is the official Flag Day. It's going to be celebrated on June the 10th at the Elks Lodge in Florence this Sunday. My friend Charlie will go into more detail on that. But uh, just an update as far as the Flag Day ceremony goes, it's actually a day of celebration and ceremony. The ceremony is actually the flag burning of any old flags that had to have to be discarded or cannot be serviced anymore. We recently held a, a burning at the uh, American Legion on April the 26th. And I was, I was quite surprised because we put out pamphlets and we put out ads in the newspaper for anybody and any of the service organizations that had flags that had to be discarded or, or destroyed in a proper manner. We had over 10,000 flags that we got rid of in one morning. And that's thanks to the American Legion and all their volunteers down there. They really stepped up. I had no idea. There were 55-gallon drums of old flags given to us to discard in a proper manner. And they've all been taken care of. So I just wanted to give you an update on that. Charlie Coleman, Charles Coleman, is uh, a good friend of mine. He's been on a Veterans Council for a number of years. He is a retired Sergeant Major, United States Army. He served three tours in Vietnam. He's a Purple Heart recipient. I don't think this community can ask for a better representative to represent Flag Day than Charlie Coleman. Charlie is a really dedicated veteran. Now, he uh, is the past commander of VFW. He'll enlighten you on that some there. But personally, you know, he's, he's been my mentor for a couple of years. He's really helped me with my morale with veterans and trying to help the veterans and all. And he took this task on last year. It hadn't been done in, in recent memory. Nobody stepped up and wanted to take charge of the Flag Day ceremony. Charlie did, and uh, we should all be proud of what he's done, and now it's going to be the second annual celebration and ceremony. Charlie, my good friend, my comrade, thank you. Thank you. Mayor, members of the City Council, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Charles Coleman. I'm currently the commander of DAV Chapter 92, Northampton, Florence area. Past commander of VFW 8006, life member also to VFW, life member of Purple Heart Association, life member of Combat Infantry Badge Association, Combat American Veterans Association, and a member of the American Legion and other organizations. My purpose here tonight is to provide a brief description on the Veterans Council of Northampton Second Annual Flag Day Ceremony. 
which will be held on June 10th, 2012 at the Elks Lodge, 17 Spring Street, Florence, Mass. Time, 4 p.m., rain or shine. I understand it could be 85 and sunny. So, leave, leave the rain part off. Uh, the, the ceremony is divided into two phases. Phase one will be conducted by the uh, exalted ruler, John Glenowich, with the assistance of Boy Scout Troop 107, who will narrate and present different flags throughout our history for the past 237 years. Phase two will be conducted by the Veterans Council of Northampton. It will perform the actual flag ceremony in conjunction with service organizations supporting Northampton area veterans, the American Legion, Disabled American Veterans, Elk Slide 997, Veterans of Farm Wars, and World War II Club of Northampton. Freshments will be served at the conclusion of the ceremony at no cost to the audience behind the main tent. The public is cordially invited to attend. Thank you for your time and attention. Any questions on what's going to happen? You're promising that 85 degrees then, Charles. Huh? You're promising that 85 degrees then? That, I mean, I the free foods. I don't promise part. nothing. <laughs> <laughs> You're not a good politician. On our, on our noggle, uh, it rained. So, but we still had 100 people. Yes, Mary. Yes, Charlie, Tommy, Brad. I want to thank you for what you did last year, which was the first time, and we had a, a really good crowd there at the Elks for Flag Day. And I want to thank you for all the hard work that all of you do. You up, Councilor? And and the time is four o'clock. Four o'clock. And breakfast is served after that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> four four p.m. Yeah. Hey, I want to thank you guys for everything you do. Thank you very much. You're welcome. My pleasure. Thank it's you again. My pleasure. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> okay, so we'll um, we'll move back up uh, to we're going to recess for finance committee. Um, yeah, yeah. So we're going to recess for finance committee. I'll okay. ask the clerk to call the roll of the finance committee. Here, Present. Dwight. Here. Present. Murphy. Here. Tate. Here. Okay, um, on your finance committee agenda tonight, there's actually a number of the um, financial orders that actually relate to the budget, um, which those were, uh, those, uh, you've actually already f uh, referred those out to the full committee when the budget was first presented. So we'll actually skip over those and those will be discussed in the committee of the whole. Um, so we'll actually move down to the uh, first financial order um, on the second page of the agenda. This is um, upon the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee, order that the city council transfer from the energy reinvestment revolving fund to the energy and sustainability revolving fund, the balance of $32,470. Is there a motion to recommend? So move. Second. So, okay. And as you know, we had a discussion and, and this council took a vote to create the new energy and sustainability revolving fund. And so this will, will in effect transfer the funds that are left over in the prior fund into this new fund uh, where it will remain moving forward. Um, so that's the purpose of this transfer. Um, I don't know if, is there any questions about that? Okay. Um, hearing none, then all those in favor of recommending say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. <coughs> so that'll move forward to the uh, full council. Um, the next item is <coughs> on the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee. Order that the city council appropriate $23,000 to the FY 2012 Central Services Custodial Supplies Account for the purpose of equipping the new police station with custodial maintenance equipment and to meet that appropriation, transfer the balance of $3,192 from the receipts reserved for appropriation at Wood Drive, Fund 2332, transfer the balance of $3,000 from the receipts reserved for appropriation, Innovative Enterprise Fund 2318, 
and transfer $16,808 from the undesignated fund balance. Move to approve. Second. 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 Okay. And I would ask the Finance Committee to recognize Mr. Pomerantz. To recognize Mr. Pomerantz. Second. Okay. Um, and, uh, and we... his memo. Okay. And I believe you have copies of his memo. Um, I need that. Okay. So I can... Don't we need to vote on recognition? Aye. Uh, uh, certainly. Aye. All those in favor of recognizing. Aye. Okay, great. Um, you've been recognized, Mr. Pomerantz. Um, okay. I will say just at the outset before you go into the, just as a, just the mechanics of the transfer, you'll note that there's a couple of small receipt reserved funds. Uh, we've been trying to go through and we've identified uh, these are among some funds that we've identified that these are receipt reserve accounts that have been dormant for many years sitting there with no balance and the purpose for them have have expired so this actually will do two things not only will it provide some of the funding for the transfer but it will eliminate these receipt reserved accounts that have not been used in many years so um, so that's where part of this funding will be coming from. So, Mr. Pomerantz. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. Um, in a nutshell, what this is requesting is that we uh, have funding to purchase now uh, the various maintenance equipment, supplies, cleaning equipment, uh, and other materials that we're going to need to stock and outfit the new police station. Uh, the station's going to come online uh, in the next two weeks. Uh, Chief Sankowitz has been moving from the old station into the new station over the last week. And uh, for those of you that have not been in the building, it's a beautiful facility. And we're going to need to keep it clean and maintained for many, many years to come. As is the case in many construction projects, uh, funding for this type of an endeavor, cleaning equipment and supplies, was not included in the original construction budget. So we're at a point now where we have to basically outfit the building so we can start keeping it clean and maintain the facility. Uh, we will order the materials uh, when we get approval to do it, and we're looking to basically outfit the building in the next two weeks and uh, also bring on the new custodial staff uh, that's included in the fiscal 13 budget, one and a half new positions to uh, basically staff the building. So that is, an, in a nutshell, is what this is a request for. Um, Without going into a lot of details about what the equipment is, it's everything from floor scrubbers and burnishers and cleaning equipment and carts that custodians will use, supplies for outfitting the locker rooms, et cetera. Uh, typical of what you'd see in any, any of the schools or city facilities. And the reason we asked Mr. Pomerantz to come tonight is because we, I know we were going to request if we could get two readings tonight so right. that you could move ahead and order the equipment to have it in time for the transition into the new building. Councilor? And the Atwood Drive Fund. Was, do we have any idea? I'm just just just, just yeah, a we, question. We we um we it's looked back and we thousand. could not find it. the most recent transaction was like FY 2003, um, and uh, we asked. Um, That's when we received. We sold a sliver of property that I believe was in the Atwood Drive area. Small it was a small. I remember the sliver. sliver. Yep. And for whatever reason, these were some residual funds left over from that transfer that have okay. been sitting there, um, again, since FY 2003, have not been used, have not been. And so we figured <clears throat> we'd like to close it out since it's not an active receipt reserve account. And so this would serve the purpose of just uh, closing it out and using those funds. Okay. And, and the $16,000, that's from, all, from the city's undesignated fund balance. That's not a... Correct. Yep. Okay. Yep. And... Um, I just would like to say too that on the sixth, the tenth of June last year, they were drilling holes in clay there. It is absolutely amazing. I have tracked the progress on the police station. It's phenomenal how smoothly and how quickly that um, that project has happened. I am just a year ago. It was a hole in the ground. They were drilling holes. Thank you. I'm amazed. Uh, point of information, sure. I don't, uh, the, on the Atwood fund, the, what I recall from back in the day was that land was surplus, and I thought it was for a cell phone tower, for the establishment of a cell phone tower, and I would assume that the reason it was set up as 
uh, an account that with anticipation of collecting funds. I thought there was some sort of there were supposed to be funds generated from that tower being located. Now I'm very vague on this, obviously, but I don't know if that rings any bells. Is that we asked Mr. Fiden and he, other than, than, than the sale of the sliver of land, uh, he was unaware there was no of there any other no ongoing, ongoing income. Um, and again, it's been it's been sitting at that balance of three thousand since FY almost <laughs> ten years. I mean, my only concern is if if there was an ongoing agreement that was being met by a a communications company, I'd i like I think the city we, we can should know about it. Yeah. We can look into that. Yeah. Um, so will this close that out? It will. Yeah. If it goes to zero it closes it out. We were gonna bring it forward to close it out and just let the money flow to free cash, but this has the same effect. So we can um, and then the other one, uh the innovative enterprise, I think that one's been sitting there since what was the date on that one? Uh, two thousand three. That again is another one that dates back to two thousand and three. It's, an it's an old grant. Um that again, there's just been a balance sitting there, um, and so this does the same thing, um, cleaning it out. So, something's not right. Um, any other questions for Mr. Pomerantz about this? Obviously, there's a great story in today's paper about the move into the new station, and so it's a it's an incredible building. So, um, and obviously, we thank the citizens of Northampton for supporting the uh, the debt exclusion to be able to build. It. Um, so. Uh, Without any other questions in finance, um, all those in favor of recommending this in finance say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Thank there you. Was suspend rule. In the We're still in finance. So oh, okay. All right. I'm sorry. Yep. But does anyone require Mr. Pomerantz to stay? For no. Okay. No. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. Financial updates. Uh, well, uh, FY 2012. Um, we're now down to days. Um, I don't know if you want to have any quick updates on that. Uh, we have two more payrolls, and I've been analyzing that and getting transfers ready that I'll bring to the next meeting um, to balance out the year. But given that we didn't have the winter that we had in prior years, we're in a little better shape than we have been in past. Not great, but um, so we'll have some transfers from free cash for the next meeting. And departments are letting me know if they have any overruns, and I have to say, Majority of the departments are, have uh, done a good job of staying within their budget this year. And then we may still have beyond that. You to be careful. July 12th, we may still have some final housekeeping, depending once we get past the true end of the year. You know, so we may have some more to bring forward on July 12th. We're trying to do the majority of the next meetings so that we can have two readings on them um, uh, then and on July 12th. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, FY 2013 budget, um, it's here before you tonight. Uh, not a whole lot has changed on you know, the state uh, the Senate um, passed its version and before the uh, last weekend, and I believe the conferees are now meeting on the final state budget. So we'll be um, waiting to see what the final product looks like. But the differences, again, between the two, the House and the Senate is about $1,000 in terms of the impact on Northampton. So there's not a big difference in terms of what's projected. So, um, okay. Um, any new business items in the Finance Committee? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Chair Jones, second. Second. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So we'll now return to the regular meeting of the City Council. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay, we have some reports of committees. Uh, first is uh, we have the committee appointments and evaluation, the minutes of April 9th, 2012. We have the committee on elections, rules, ordinances, orders, and claims, minutes of April 9th, 2012. Transportation and Parking Commission, minutes of April 17th, 2012. And we have the finance committee minutes of April 24th, 2012. Move as a group. Second it. Okay. Any discussion or questions on these minutes? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So I don't see sick. Okay. Uh, there have been a request to move up one of the items uh, for a staff person. Um, is she outside? She's uh, okay. Okay. Um, 
there had been a request to move up a couple of uh, to move up the CPA items ahead of the budget because mm -hmm. we had a staff person here so we rather than keep them for the entire budget um, so uh, with the council's permission I would um, I would ask to move and take up the uh, the financial order on page three at the bottom of page three uh, begins with the Beaver Brook, Beaver Brook Bridge project that's the one that's Hard to say fast. And, and these are second readings, correct? What's that? These are all, all second, second readings. They're all seconds. <coughs> so this is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Community Preservation Commission. Ordered that, uh, let's see, this is the, let me just grab, do them in the order that they're on. Uh, I think I have the, um, just want to make sure I get them in the, okay, this is the B. Okay. Um, uh, whereas the Northampton Office of Planning and Development submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding for rehabilitation to the Arch Bridge over Beaver Brook, whereas the project advances the goals of the Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan and the Sustainable Northampton Plan and the Northampton CPA Plan, whereas repair and rehabilitation are needed to ensure that it is safe for pedestrians and bicycles and to ensure that this historic structure remains for future generations, whereas the project serves a public purpose by preserving a structure of important historic significance, and whereas the Office of Planning and Development's application states that, quote, the city will inspect the bridge annually and perform ongoing maintenance as necessary to keep the bridge in good condition, and whereas the applicant will make reasonable efforts to place a historic preservation restriction on the bridge, and whereas on April 18, 2012, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend 104,000 in Community Preservation Committee, uh, in Community Preservation Act funds uh, be used to support the project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that 104000 be appropriated from Community Preservation Act funding to the Office of Planning and Development for the Beaver Brook Bridge Project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $94,650 is appropriated from the CPA Budgeted Reserve, and $9,350 is appropriated from the CPA Historical Budgeted Reserve. Move to approve. Second. There's a motion made and seconded on second reading. Um, and are there any? Qu I would Just ask to recognize Sarah Lavalley. From Thank you. OPD. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. So Ms. Lavalley is here, and she can answer questions on these. I think we have a couple questions, uh, Sarah. Councilor Tacy. The, the state doesn't have any jurisdiction over this whatsoever, do they? Uh, the bridge project? Yes. As a funding agency or? As a funding agency or as an inspection agency or maintenance or oversight or anything. Is that correct? They, I'm, they would have some responsibility, I think, just for bridge safety. Um, but I, since it's not, since it's only a pedestrian and bike bridge, that, that it's a lot, a lot more limited than a, a vehicle bridge. So the maintenance is all on us? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And yeah, there's no there's no funding source available for uh, bike and head bridges, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. That was my only question. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions on this particular project? Um, okay. Um, all right. Hearing none. All those in favor on second reading, say aye. 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 Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay, so that one is adopted on second reading. Um, uh, the next item is upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the C Community Preservation Committee, ordered that whereas the C Northampton Conservation Committee submitted a CPA ap application for purchase of up to 87 acres, which will fill a gap in the Broadbrook Greenway slash Fitzgerald Lake Conservation Area, whereas this is an environmentally important location, and whereas this project meets the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, Northampton Community Preservation Plan, and Open Space Recreation and Multi-Use Trail Plan to protect open space and provide for passive recreation. Whereas the CPA application was premised on providing opportunities for trail linkages and access points at the discretion of the Conservation Commission. 
and whereas pedestrian access from Coles Meadow Road will be provided, and whereas on April 18, 2012, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $290,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project, and whereas on March 1, 2012, City Council voted to authorize the purchase of this property, and that authority remains in effect. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $290,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Commission for the Broadbrook Gap project, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $290,000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. Move to approve. Second. Second. Okay. Are there any questions about this project? Councilor Schwartz. I had a question from constituent regarding who owned the, who owns the property who are we buying it from uh, Edward and Henry Kabosiak okay. I don't know I, I mean I, I always do like that I'm not sure what else to <laughs> okay any other questions about this particular order okay um, hearing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. opposed any abstentions okay so that one is approved on second reading. The next one, upon the recommendation of Mayor David J. Narkowitz and the Community Preservation Committee, ordered that whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission submitted an application for the Community Preservation Act funding for the Conservation Fund, and whereas the fund makes possible increased acquisition or protection of open space parcels in Northampton by supporting fast action on time-sensitive real estate opportunities. Whereas the project may leverage additional public and or private funds, whereas the project meets the goals of the Northampton Sustainability Plan for protection of open space and agricultural lands, whereas the applicant has used these funds effectively in the past towards the protection of several hundred acres of open space reflecting the goals established by the Community Preservation Committee, and whereas on April 18, 2012, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $50,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $50,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Fund, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $50,000 is appropriated from CPA Budgeted Reserve. Move to approve. Second. Are there any questions about this? <coughs> yeah. <coughs> is, is Wayne? Oh, Wayne's not here, is he? He's, could, he's uh, away this week. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, do we, what was the percentage he gave us on the, uh, the money or the uh, amount of land that was on the percentage of the land mass of the city? Was it 19%? I think it was under, it was under 20. It might have been 17. That was in pristine condition. Is that what you're asking, Council? Yeah. Okay. I under think it, it's, it's about 17%. About 17%. Okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions about this particular order? Yeah, one more question. Okay, Councilor. Is that more or less than surrounding communities? Do we know that? Because I asked that question before. It's permanently protected as yeah. open space? That I, I don't know. Um, I would imagine that some communities it's more and, and some some it would be less. Depending Go ahead. Councilor Freeman Daniels. I would say that um, the relevant question is whether it's more or less than other cities or, or Why would you say it similarly rural? sized towns because you have a lot of surrounding communities that are mostly rural by nature. Yeah. Uh, so they, they might have much, a much greater percentage of pristine or, or land that, that compared to you know, Westfield and uh, East Hampton. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Spector. Just, just so I understand this, what we're approving <coughs> is a fund so that if there's land that comes available we can do this in a timely fashion. That doesn't mean that, the, that we are then out of the loop on that, is that correct? It's just so that the process can be, can operate in more timely fashion. Is that, is that the reason for this fund? Yes. My understanding is it's used for soft costs, for appraisals, for right. those kinds so that, of things. That it's not that, the, that OPD can just then buy the land and use this money. It, it's so that if something comes up, it's still going to go through processes so we can decide not to purchase yeah. it but at mm -hmm. least we won't lose an opportunity because of the time exactly yeah. I get it and mm -hmm. this is also used not only for those pristine areas but also for neighborhood 
acquisitions and working lands, which were the other two categories of open space. Okay. Thank you. Councillor, did you have a question? No, I'm okay. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so hearing no other questions on this one, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that's adopted on second reading. And the final, upon the recommendation of Mayor David Jane Arkowitz and the Community Preservation Committee, ordered that whereas the Hampshire Council of Government submitted a CPA application for the first phase of historical rehabilitation to the Hampshire County Courthouse, whereas the project provides a broad public benefit to the citizens of Northampton and the region, whereas the project serves a public purpose by preserving a structure and downtown green space of important historical significance, and whereas the Council of Governments will provide a conservation restriction to the city of Northampton on the courthouse lawn. And whereas on April 18, 2012, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend $100,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $100,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Conservation Commission for the Hampshire County Courthouse renovation, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and City Council. Specifically, $100,000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve account and, the city, and that the City of Northampton is authorized to acquire for conservation, passive recreation, and historic preservation purposes any easement and any conservation and or historic preservation restriction as defined in Mass General Law Chapter 184, Section 31 of the General Laws in the Historic Courthouse and or Courthouse Lawn consistent with the Community Preservation Act and that the City approves such easements and conservation and historic preservation restrictions. Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second. Councilor I'd like to amend this to uh, strike the final two paragraphs. Okay. Um, so there's been a motion made to strike the final two paragraphs of this particular um, order. I'll, I'll second for purposes of discussion. Okay. Councillor, would so, you explain your amendment? Yeah, thank you. Um, first, actually, I'd like to point out I, I'm not really sure that the uh, preamble is correct. It looked like from the review of the April 18th minutes that the CPC voted to advance this four to two. Is that correct? Uh, no, that was that was an initial discussion, but um, but the final vote for this project was unanimous. Okay. That was on a, a, a portion of the, the resolution. Oh, oh, my mistake. Um, so the reason for my uh, wanting to wanting to strike the final two paragraphs is really that uh, the city council gives a lot of power to the conservation commission to accept and to write these conservation restrictions. And um, once it leaves our desk, uh, we actually have no way of making sure that it actually happens. And uh, it's actually quite timely that uh, um, that the neighbors from Montview came in today to talk about how just maybe 12 years ago the council passed something very similar and uh, authorized a conservation restriction which was then never actually completed uh, so I think that uh, the council should take a slightly more active interest in these conservation restrictions uh, and I think that starts with having um, the planning board or the conservation committee come back to the council when they actually have the conservation restriction written and ready to go and then the council approves it so I'd like it's not that I'm against the conservation restriction on the lawn although maybe not on the entire lawn or something like that but I do believe it's a mistake to give um, them permission to do it right now without actually seeing the conservation restriction and without knowing the parties are ready to go Councilor. So <clears throat> you just want this to come back to the council for approval, secondary approval? Yeah. Oh, I just, the conservation restriction part. Right. Not the entire order. I, just I'm in favor of restoring the building, and I, yeah. it's great that the council of governments wants, wants it, but I think it's a mistake, just like the, the council made 12 years ago when it authorized, a con it's, it does it a lot, actually. We authorize conservation restrictions, and we, I think we assume that our will be done, but it, it doesn't. Hmm sometimes and uh, I think it's better that once the parties are ready they bring it back to us. Councilor. Um, 
I just don't understand if, if it, I would support that if it's possible. I don't understand. I'm not familiar with what the process is. Can we separate out the conservation restriction? Can we separate it out? If that's a, if, if it can be done and come back, uh, I would be okay with that. But if someone could explain the actual process. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll defer. I've got no idea. I just read that if we're going to grant authorization, I now, understand. We can probably do it later, right? But the, I'm I was going to sure. just ask, I was going to ask if some, if, uh, perhaps uh, Sarah could explain what the final paragraph actually what does that mean when it says and that city council approves such easements and conservation restrictions does that mean we're giving the council's giving approval tonight or that it, you'd have to come back and get approval of that conservation restriction that okay. would mean that, that that approval would be granted tonight tonight um, okay but just a clarification about the a slight difference between the the Montview CR and the CR um, the CR that's been discussed at, at Montview would have to be held by someone else. Um, the city owns the property, so some other third-party nonprofit would have to hold that. And in this case, the city would be the holder of the restriction. So that's just a, a clarification there. Um, just a quick question then. Is this granted um, by the uh, CPC as uh, in the in the form of historic preservation or conservation it's or historic preservation um, but in the the council of government's application they stressed not only how historic the, the building itself was but also the the use of the property and the the historic nature of the lawn and all the things that had happened there so in terms of our formula for allocations is it coming out of the historic preservation piece or both or historic preservation it is. Yes. Okay. So could you address that issue if we struck the last two paragraphs? Would that in any way impede moving forward on the project if you came back and, and needed approval from the council? I just want to understand the process itself. It would be, um, it would be an additional burden on the, the commission and then on the council to review it later and, and discuss it, but it's definitely possible. It's yeah. possible. So the burden would be more the timely quality of or, the work involved in doing that yeah it wouldn't hold up the project in any way well the um it wouldn't no okay so are there any other discussion on the amendment the proposed amendment okay Move it. okay so then the question before you is to strike the last two paragraphs of the order before you um, all those in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Okay, so the amendment is accepted and we're back to the main motion. Move approval. Or, second. I'm sorry. Second. Yeah. <laughs> so any other discussion on the main uh, question? Okay. Uh, so then we'll call that. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, so that one is approved as amended on second reading. That's the final CPA order, so thank you thank very you. much. Um, okay, great. Okay, so um, we'll now return back to the um, to the original uh, portion of the budget, which are the financial orders, and I'm actually going to, um, given the fact that this is uh, the budget that I have submitted to the city council. Um, yep. for its consideration. I'm actually going to step down from the chair and I'm going to ask, uh, to turn the gavel to the city council president um, and have the city council president uh, conduct these proceedings. And I will be available to answer questions or to any specific issues related to it. I just uh, wanted to sort of frame this in the proper frame and that is this is the city council considering the budget. Council. Just before you step down. Just so the folks at home, this was said once, but I want to make sure people understand. These are all the same numbers that came in that budget that we have discussed at the, is it, at the hearings. Yes. Okay. I just want to make sure that these, these are, are all the individual orders these are just that are in the back of the budget book that right. represent the total totality of the budget as it's laid out. Thank That's you. Um, yeah, there's no changes. So I don't do that. Uh, sit there, sure. I can give you. Sure. <clears throat> and the orders are here, so thanks. We'll have to. Thank you. And uh, you, you will be available to speak. Yes, we will. We will at right here. the podium. Remember, <laughs> don't forget to speak. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you all. Uh, uh, begging your indulgence, because I'm going to hack my way through this, and I'm in a mild narcotic haze, so <laughs> should make it amusing. Mr. President, could we waive the reading this of each of the orders, unless any specific mm -hmm. ones, rather just summarize the, uh, mm -hmm. the amounts of the order? I would like to put that forward. And I'll second that. Mm -hmm. All those in favor of reading the orders. Can we, can we have a discussion on that real quick? Because I see. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm yeah, sorry. Well, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd be very comfortable taking the general fund and then maybe the Department of Public Works water, sewer, and solid waste together and then maybe taking the revolving funds as a group. But I don't think I'd want to lump them all I'll together. I'll be fine with that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll so withdraw my motion. To, so what is your friendly, friendly, a friendly amendment? <laughs> So the motion is to separate the general budget and the enterprise and funds, the revolving funds, and then we get down to some other transfers that we may want to take individually. But so, okay, all right. So we'll move on to. Hi. So the first motion that would be entertained is on uh, on the first order in the general fund. Um, Actually, I, you know, begging your indulgence, I actually think it's appropriate to read at least this. The, mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, ordered that, uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee, ordered that the sum of $74,572,429 is the full amount necessary for the fiscal year 2013 general fund budget, July 1st, 2012 to June 30th, 2013 to be appropriated for the purposes stated. To meet this appropriation, $1,616,806 will be raised and appropriated from parking meter receipts reserved, $5,000 from Cemetery Perpetual Care Trust uh, Fund, $5,000 from the Cemetery Sale of Lots Receipts Reserved, $1,806,937 from Sewer Enterprise Funds, $699,000, $699,354 from the Water Enterprise Funds, $178,589 from the Solid Waste Enterprise Funds, $6,184 from Wetlands Filing Fees, $3,900 from the Waterways Fund, $11,595 from the Community Preservation Act Administrative Funds, $165,000 from the Comcast INET Reserve Fund, $145,000 from the energy rebates, $46,768 from the reserve for police station debt service, and $69,882,296 will be raised and appropriate. So moved. Second it. Any discussion? Council LaBarge. Yes, um, I want to say that this was not an easy budget and i know some of us counselors who've been here for quite a long time this was a very difficult budget we had to look at all the departments very very carefully our mayor our department heads they had to make some significant changes in their departments i also feel with the school departments and education, that has been a serious problem. What do we need to do? There needs to be changes here. And I know with Councillor Schwartz, um, at that point when um, David was our council president, we all went to Boston to really be very vocal about changing the how the tax rate was put in place, where the wealthy would be treated much more differently than the middle class and the poor people. That we, as middle class people or poor people, okay, would have the rights to be treated with that respect and dignity of not <coughs> being able to be treated with somebody who is very, very rich and who also is paying what we're paying. So we have a problem here. And I think this really needs to be looked at, and I'm hoping that 
my very dear counselor, Pamela Schwartz, that we get together, and I've been harping with her on this because it's caused such a financial problem, not just in our city of Northampton, but throughout the whole state. And I know we have a lot of backing and a lot of support from many professors from the universities. I was really impressed when we went to Boston of all the, the, the people who were so concerned about what was occurring with us not having enough of money. I, have to, I want to thank our mayor for doing an excellent job on our budget because it was not easy. You have stepped up to the plate. You have had to make some drastic changes. I think with we needed to look at the parking division, it had to be done. We needed to look <coughs> at the clerk's office. That was a very difficult decision. I'm still having a hard time with that. We're taking away a position there. But I think the department head and I think the staff there will be able, in due respect, be able to work something out. I want to commend especially um, Melissa Lamprin and her staff for coming and stepping up to the plate the way they did when they took over the parking division. There was no problems there. Nobody complained about it. They did their job, and they worked together. I also want to thank David Pomerantz for stepping up to the plate and taking over another big headache, which is the parking division. I want to thank all the department heads, and I want to thank all the staff for doing what they're doing to help us make our city what it is. I'm supporting this budget because I think that we have done the best we can with what we have as far as money. I think that we have taken positions, we have done away with a couple of departments, and we had to make that decision. I think with all the budget hearings that we had, there was a tremendous amount of studying. I know I spent from Thursday night until the following Tuesday going through my budget book, asking questions in the hearings. Big cuts had to be made, and I commend our mayor for doing what he did. And so I think now it's going to be up to us counselors to really start watching what is happening here in our departments. We do have some cuts here. We need to keep very close contact, like with the city clerk's office, to see if they are operating OK, if there is a problem because of losing that position. So I'm supporting the budget. <coughs> Councilor Carney, then Councilor Spector. Um, I also want to offer some kudos to our mayor and to finance director Susan Wright. This was a daunting task uh, given our limited resources in the city, especially this year, uh, facing the, uh, the loss of the, um, the solid waste uh, enterprise fund that we had and trying to make ends meet with um, so many challenges. So I do. Um, Thank you for that and for all your hard work on this. I have a little um, procedural question, I guess. Um, is the, does the Board of Trustees at the Smith Volk School need to approve their budget before we approve this? And it was a question that someone asked me prior, and I'll, I'll direct this to the mayor. Maybe. Um, uh, the uh, Board of Trustees voted on a budget uh, at its last meeting. Uh, and uh, they have, um, uh, there's a difference opinion, of, of opinion right now between myself and the Board of Trustees on their budget. It's a difference of about $9,700. And uh, we're currently looking at that issue uh, with um, uh, legal counsel, uh, both Smith Folk's legal counsel and the city's legal counsel. I believe that uh, under our system that uh, the city council has the final authority uh, the mayor and the city council have the final authority for appropriating the budget. And so there's a disagreement there. Um, but uh, that, I believe, we'll have a resolution on that before this budget comes back to you for second reading. So I can report back to you on that. Okay. And um, I guess the, the relevant point there is that um, as the budget is submitted to us, as the city council, uh, we can't 
we can't increase any lines in, in any event. The only thing we can do is make cuts. Yeah. So um, uh, if there was a difference of 9,000, it's not something that this body could, could add. <laughs> can't put it. So um, thanks for that. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay. Council Specter. <clears throat> yeah, I was uh, second what Council Labarge says. I think this is my ninth budget I've looked at. And uh, every year it's been tough. Never been here where we've had a budget coming in where we're saying, well, let's, let's, we've got some extra money here. Why don't we see? Should we give it, you know, back to property owners? Should we uh, start some new programs? It's never been fun in all these years. And unfortunately, I don't see the, any light at the end of the tunnel. I think we're just going to see more and more of these budgets. I do think both this year and in the past, our city officials have done absolute best they can with the cards they're dealt. I guess that was not the right, they play the best they can with the cards they're dealt. And I just wrote down a few things that in just the last couple of weeks, I've heard, gotten emails from people saying, many emails saying, can't we get more money for schools with multiple different specific requests, either more money for teachers, either more money, you can't cut this program, and desperate, and I, I totally agree with them. I've gotten other people writing me and saying, can't we start replanting our city tree cover? Do you know that we're losing most of this tree cover? Mm -hmm. We have no funds, we're not replanting it. It's very important we do it. We don't have money to do it. A few people, certainly in my ward, and I know in other wards, keep saying, our streets are a mess. Can't we get to, can't we just fill up some of these really deep potholes? We don't have the money to do it. Finally, and I could go on and on, but can't we get more of the playing, I just spoke to people today, say so the playing fields, can't we get all of the playing fields, because there aren't enough repaired and, and re we can't do it, we don't have the money. So I think this list is just gonna grow each year and I hope everybody understands that I think we are, we are just doing the best we can given the money we have. I think all of us would like to do all of these things, and I think the list could be increased by 10 or 20. And uh, I want to thank the mayor and I want to thank your staff a lot for not only doing a great budget, but I think the presentation of it in this book this year has just been, for someone like me who struggled a lot of nine <laughs> budgets, I always go, what does this mean? What does that mean? And this is the first year, and I don't think it's because of the longevity, but the presentation where it was so clear and I really understood it. I want to thank you for that. Councilor Schwartz and Councilor Tate. I, I just want to briefly say I echo what others counselors have said before me. I want to really tip my hat to Mayor Narkowitz um, for steering us through this tough fiscal time um, with, I just, I think, tremendous um, um, vigilance and understanding of, of what it takes to maintain our basic services under incredibly difficult times. and. And that, true to Councilor LaBarge, um, we do have work to do that is beyond these city borders in order to really fundamentally address the situation and not have Councilor Spector do yet another budget, another budget, <laughs> another budget that's not, where there's nowhere yeah. nearly enough. And, um, and I am continuing to work on that level with other partners um, in this area, in the region, and across the state, looking to um, bring together activists locally to really, uh, local <laughs> activists in multiple communities across the state to um, push on Beacon Hill for tax reform. And the hopeful news is that there, are, there is, there are murmurings afoot on Beacon Hill that next year could be a time where they're ready to take on the issue of tax reform and particular even around our tax expenditures, things like tax breaks for companies who film movies in Massachusetts. The list is incredibly long. The dollar amount is incredibly high of what we are giving tax breaks for. That's just one example of the kind of reform that we can work on and I hope we as a community lend our voices to that and I will certainly do my part and invite others to join. And, um, and in the meanwhile, I think we are doing the best we can and, and we also have to figure out how to do better. So, but thank you. Thank you to all of our leadership and our city staff. Thank you. Councilor Tacey. Yeah, I want to also again thank the mayor and Susan Wright and your, all your, your staff in the office for a job that's not easy. Um, and I want to thank the council too for, you know, a lot of this budget too is formed by the council's attitude um, on things that they support and don't support and through history. So thank the council also. But <clears throat> there, and as you can imagine, I've read this. Um, and a lot of it, um, 
is is the mayor's prerogative and, and um, some things I'm not 100 percent on board with but it's the mayor's budget and um, and I agree with it um, there's the one line item that I can't get by is uh, a twenty thousand dollar nine hundred eighty twenty thousand nine hundred eighty six dollars on the council on aging on comp time payout that's the one what page uh, page 72 it's the one I I really looked at it closely I can't uh, comprehend I, I've been trying to get some backup literature through the auditor's office and but anyway I just think it's one one item is there something that I've said it's wrong What's oh that? okay uh, but it's on page 72 it's a line item for $21,000 and I, I have the contracts for NAPIA here and all the way through it, it always talks about a 40 hour limit on comp time and I know that we end up with 935 hours but there is a there is a 40 hour limit and unless it goes through uh, collective bargaining and negotiating I don't see how we can accumulate a thousand hours of comp time so especially if there's no back if somebody comes to me in my business and says I have 50 hours last week that um, I need to be paid for and I'll ask them what it's for if they can't tell me I'm not paying them but so I, I really looked for some backup documentation on these hours and have been able to through the auditor's office or human resources or um, or, 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 or anything so and this is for a person that was the president of Napier for a dozen years or so which I have the contracts here and I'm just kind of curious as to how we could get some backup documentation before the second reading on this is that possible uh, Councilor the mayor of that I'm sorry <laughs> no that's 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 what the mayor's here so for. just just um, just to put this in context uh, you may recall when I was serving as acting mayor um, at the end of 2011, we had discussions in the Finance Committee about this issue of comp time, which we began to study. And obviously, uh, that study has resulted in some of the recommendations we've made in this budget. And we did discover that there have been, uh, there are some significant comp time balances that are, um, that do exceed either some city policies as well as some collective bargaining agreements. Uh, obviously, these were, uh, accumulations that occurred before I was mayor I was not the supervisor of these individuals and the way that our system is set up is we have um, uh, you know we have we have processes within departments but when the hours are then entered into the munis system into the payroll system um, they are there they are part of the payroll records for those employees um, so I've you know, in terms of whether or not they can just be erased once they've been allowed to accumulate, and uh, there's a question about, uh, despite the agreement, if if the practice is to allow it to exceed that, um, then you know essentially then that then that sort of uh, the, then the contract has been allowed to the practice has been to allow people to exceed it. My goal in this is to first get some of those balances back down to where they should be back to the contractually agreed upon um, limits and then to put in place some uh, some uh, policies as well as some uh, accounting procedures going forward so that we can monitor and have the kind of documentation that you're talking about um, so that there's authorization of comp time and in the case of a department head that that is authorized by the supervisor which would be me um, so that's what I'm working on sort of looking forward and what we've tried to do in the budget is take several of the departments that have these uh, larger comp time balances and attempt to pay them down um, as opposed to letting them continue to be a, a liability moving forward that could cost more in the future um, in terms of the documentation obviously I you have access to everything I have access to which is what is submitted payroll records that are signed um, and and other documentation that goes to the auditor's office for payment and when those uh, payrolls are entered into munis um, and again I've you know you've heard publicly the explanation for those um, I can try to 
I can discuss them with, with you between now and second reading, uh, but really what you have is what I have um, in terms of documentation. So, and then just out of the uh, art, Article 7 compensatory time in the NAPIA contract, employees may request compensatory time for hours worked within the following guidelines. No more than 40 hours may be, may be accumulated for compensatory time. The department head will keep a record of all compensatory time. These records will be made available upon request to the Human Resources Department. So, and then record keeping procedures, department heads shall be as established by Human Resources Director. Record, record keeping for employees in this association shall be accomplished by regarding recording compensatory time and the payroll sheet submitted to the auditor. I can't find any. So, um, and it says no more than 40 hours. So I don't know where the authority would lie. I, I can't find it anywhere where somebody can even authorize more than 40 hours. In that, I, I, anyway, without going through a collective bargaining agreement again. It's so again, it is difficult for me. This was comp time that was accumulated. I, I understand a, a period from you know in 2007, 2008. It, 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 so it's it's a it's not a period that I had direct supervision over anyone. So it's I cannot recreate that for you. Um, and I understand that, and I'm really not asking too. I just I'm just stating my opinion mm -hmm. that um, weeks here. 83 hours of comp time in a pay period, 69 hours of comp time, 53 hours of comp time, so 77 hours of comp time, uh, and then and then in some instances, uh, 40 hours of comp time earned and 24 used mm -hmm. in the same pay period. So I, I don't understand. I have the records. Yet. I don't understand how all that works, but I would like somebody to explain it to me, and. Uh, and this, and as far as it goes, the president of this union is the one that has committed the comp time. And she know, and at it, the time. At oh, the time. Yes, that's correct. So anyway, uh, I'm not comfortable paying out this kind of money out of out of the that's out of the uh, out of the budget for something that cannot be reconciled. You cannot. If you can't tell me what these hours are for, I'm not comfortable with making that payment. And I'll just, I'll stop at that. I, I know you can't, and I'm not, I'm not asking you to tell me what those hours are because I know you can't, but I would at least think that the department head should be able to tell me what those hours are. Uh, and if not, then they don't exist. And as far as the comp time policy goes, I know the comp time policy says you can get, but it's different throughout the city. We have 480 hours that the police department can get, or excuse me, the, the fire department. Yeah and 80 hours that the police department can get, and 40 hours for everybody else, and I understand how we got to the 48 hour, the 480 hours in the fire department. I understand that very well. That's low relative so, to where it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the comp time policy, it, it, I, it was explained to me also from the human resources director that it says you get up to 40 hours, and then once you get more than 40 hours, what do we do with it? It's not. It's not defined. It's not specific what to do with the additional hours. Well, it says you only get 40 hours, so there shouldn't be more. So anyway, I'll I'll, well, I'll stop. But I I I would like to strike the twenty thousand twenty one thousand dollars out of that line item. I'd like to I can that tell out. you I can tell you that I you know I've met with department heads and we've we've begun a discussion about what my expectations are around the the management of comp time. I mean I think comp time can be a is an important. Uh, management tool in terms of trying to avoid overtime and trying to provide a mechanism where extra hours can be worked and then worked off through comp time. I think, but the concern is if, if you don't follow these policies and it, it's allowed to accumulate and accumulate. So my goal is moving forward is to stay within those limits, not to let it accumulate and to make sure we have the record keeping uh, so that we can provide the documentation. Um, uh, again, the difficulty is that those hours have been entered into the payroll records of an employee, and they're, they're, we've, the city has authorized them to be entered in. And so uh, then it becomes very difficult to then say we are just going to wipe them away. Um, because by putting them into that MUNA system, we have essentially authorized that time. We have, uh, this, you know, the, the city has authorized that time. Um, I guess my question is the, the time that is 
been put into the immune system and authorized by the department head is the same recipient of those hours. And there's no documentation or backup documentation that tells you what those hours were or what it was worked for. That's my, that's my point. And that I understand, but what I'm saying is that that time then goes through the auditor's office, which then is you know overseen through the financial team and the mayor. So, um, and I have you know right now I, I sign the payrolls every two weeks, uh, and the finance director signs the payroll. So I, I I put my signature on that payroll. I'm saying that I hereby approve everything that's in that payroll. Uh, so that's the difficulty. Um, so, I'll. And so I, what I'm trying to correct is the pra we've there's been a practice where we've allowed these caps to be exceeded. Um, it's been a past practice. I'm using language past practice. Uh, mm -hmm. And so um, <coughs> and so I'm going to try to get the practice back to where it should be. I'll, I'll just end with because I had been I've been asking this for a few years on this comp time, this, this question. And I asked the former finance director, Chris Pyle, I asked him twice. I said, how do you budget for comp time? He says, well, we don't budget for comp time because it's budget neutral. And I, I don't get it. How can comp time be budget neutral? So I'll leave, I'll leave it at that. And I know it, it's not a reflection on you. I mean, this has happened before mm -hmm. you got here. But um, well, if I can't see some documentation that says what this time is for, uh, in my opinion, I... I just, I just couldn't, well, uh, I couldn't so just, just to answer your on that money to answer your question just about the budget neutrality piece if you read the complete policy it's typically you're allowed to accrue it and then you have to use it within a certain number of pay periods mm -hmm. right. so that's the expectation that you accrue right. it but then you then use it up yep. so I think that's probably what mr. Pyle that ideally it's it's revenue neutral because it's not going to create a liability um, from year to year you may have a balance, but but so but that's that's the idea. Um, I just don't I don't, I don't want to spend any okay. time on it. I just want to tell you that I wouldn't okay. pay it. I'd like to I'd like to yank that twenty one thousand dollars out of there. That's just my opinion. Uh, Councilor Freeman Danielson and Councilor Thank you. Uh, Labarge. This is about the same issue. So, um, I think there are really two here. Uh, and allow me to just to to clarify and and I'll end with a question to you, Councilor Tacey, Actually, uh, I think the first issue is does the, does the council believe or does a majority of the council believe that uh, that comp time was properly accrued? And if the council does not believe that, then uh, we, the council can strike $20,986 $20, from that budget and basically force the mayor to look at whatever legal action the, mayor might, the mayor's office of the administration might take to uh, unwind all the approvals that have happened in the last decade. So that's, I think, that's our, that's our only option. Because the, the second issue is not whether the city owes comp time and, uh, and how much, but how the city will repay that comp time. Uh, and if you look at the whole budget, um, I'm, this is, even though it's my second term, it's my first budget. So. Uh, I'm not an expert, but it seems to me that the mayor is doing a, a lot of work to try to clean up the books, especially the liabilities, mm -hmm. to give, get us in a good cash position uh, so that we can continue to fund new infrastructure projects, take on new debt, and to try to eliminate future liabilities, because that's really what the comp time is. It's a, it will become a future liability when it gets that large, and it is already that large. So the mayor's budget, uh, yeah, maybe... You could have we could have dipped more into the free cash that may be available, but uh, uh, instead the mayor is taking the, the 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 choice, and I think it's a good choice uh, in general, even though it, it involves some cuts, of cleaning up the liabilities uh, and getting onto a sustainable path uh, for the free cash and for and which will help us on in the long term by being able to borrow at reasonable rates. So, given. That we've that this that the cities has accrued that liability that comp time liability, um, how are we going to discharge it? And I think this is a this is a step that takes it from that budget neutrality and makes it makes it into a fiscal number, but it, at least it discharges the liability. So the question is, so so I think the second issue we can't really get around that number, unless 
we want to go to the first issue, which is we don't think that comp time was legitimately accrued, and we want to force the city to take some sort of legal action. I don't even know if it's possible, but cutting that line, and I, I'm not sure if you made that motion there or not, Councilor Tasty, but cutting that line would, in my mind, force the city to, to look into its legal recourse against that accrued comp time. Um, as it stands, uh, I'm, if, it, if it has been accrued legitimately, we have to discharge it. And putting it in the book instead of just pretending it doesn't exist is, I think, a responsible thing to do. So I guess I don't know who to ask. I mean, do you, I'm sure you've investigated some of the legal recourse on some of this, some of this accrued comp time, and I can't imagine that there is one. Um, but it seems to me that that's our only option. Uh, I guess what I, um, I've, I've definitely had conversations about this with our HR director, with council around, uh, in terms of uh, can can one just sort of magically wipe the slate clean? And the difficulty again is that it an employee has as this this uh, this time has been put to their um, to their payroll records. It's been yes, it was signed off by the employee in question, but then it was countersigned uh, by the chief executive officer and went through the auditor's office and all of that. Um, and so it's, uh, and so that's, that's really what's there. And I think there's an assumption, there's, there's an assumption that if that has happened, then that was valid time. Um, and again, it's difficult for me to go back. I've obviously spoken, the, the uh, employee in question has talked about it publicly, about the time period in question, and that there is a work being done related to uh, the construction of the senior center and all the other activities related to that. That's, she's talked about that publicly. Um, we've talked about it privately. Uh, that's the information that I have. Um, and so I, again, I, I uh, I suspect if I were to go ahead and, and start voiding those balances that have exceeded the policies, I suspect I'd be um, probably spending more than $20,000 uh, in legal bills defending um, grievances uh, filed by bargaining units. Thank you. So, so then I guess my question for you, Councilor Tacey, is do you think it's worth it to try to force a legal action about that comp time? Because if it's not, to, in my mind, we have to pay for it somehow, and starting now is as good as time as any. The duties of the department head are spelt out in the contract to keep tr to keep track of the records and what the time is for. All I'm asking for is to see the records and what the time is for. If you tell me that I owe you fifty dollars and I ask you what it's for and you say, "Well, I don't know," you just owe it to me. You're gonna you're, it's gonna be a cold day before you collect that fifty bucks. I can uh, uh, counsel the barge. Okay. This is for the mayor, please. Sure. I'm really uncomfortable here. I feel that I'm hearing about a department head, and I don't care who the department head is, of a problem, apparently, that occurred, what, the first two years, I think, that she had mentioned about the senior center when they were opening it or whatever. How many years has it been that that director has not used that con time at all? Only the first two years. I had great concerns, Councillor Tacey, in the mayor's office, in front of Kareen, when you mentioned about the amount of comp time, which I didn't know until you brought that up, about what certain departments had for amounts of comp time that were occurred, correct? And you also had, we had another staff person from City Hall in the office. I went to Susan Wright of great concerns of what I had heard about the amount of comp time with one director plus other departments. Susan and I spent a lengthy time together in her office, and it's just not one director. There is several people who have comp time on the books. And I asked her to go to the mayor that I would really like a plan put in place to clean this comp time and get it back to where it should be. You do your 40 hours, whatever, your limit on your comp time. I'm just having these bad feelings about hearing that a director is 
the president of the union or whatever, she or he, no matter what, still has to get permission from the above, which is the mayor to grant that comp time. So I don't know who was in charge then, Mayor, maybe you can answer to this. If this department head that we're hearing about today apparently was putting in for her comp <clears throat> time, it had to be approved. Who approved it? I think what Councillor Tacey is saying that, um, and I will, this isn't one of the issues that I'm, that I'm trying to address going forward, is that typically um, a department head um, is, is the person that um, signs off on the payroll for their department. I understand. Um, for their, and, and including their own uh, payroll as well. What I'm, in terms of the, in the case of comp time and things like that, uh, in most departments, there's not a pre-authorization process for a department head. I will say uh, n there, there's not a lot of comp time taken by department heads uh, generally. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are some departments where there is, um, you know, for example, the building commissioner, for example, um, who frequently works essentially 24-7, and so there's comp time used in that department. Um, as a way to manage the use of time, same in the Board of, the board of Health, right. Health Department. Um, so there are some departments, the nature of the work, there's comp, and obviously we've talked about police and fire um, as another one. Um, so what I'm trying to work on in, in these departments is to have a, a pre-authorization form that did not exist that I'm aware of, but uh, as I said, um, all of those departmental payrolls get submitted. They're signed by their department heads. They get submitted. They go through the auditor's office. The auditor compiles them all, and there's an overall payroll that is signed off uh, every two weeks um, through my office, uh, by, either by the finance director or myself. Um, and so that is the process. So, um, and those are all payrolls that were uh, duly signed off on. So. Okay, so a department head puts in for their own comp time, correct? But a mayor doesn't have any communication going on that so much comp time is being used. It has to be, and I feel I, that I, a mayor I should believe, know. Yeah. And again, I, I believe, I'm, I, it's hard, I cannot speculate about that, except I'm, I'm I fairly certain that. that the former mayor was aware of the comp time. I do I, too. I know that there was a point, as has been said publicly, by this department head that the former mayor asked this department head to stop accumulating comp time. Exactly. So there's obvious, there was obviously a discussion about it and, and some knowledge and understanding of it. That's, well, I feel that um, there had to be some communication um, with the department head to use that amount of comp time because it stopped within that two years. And, and again, as I reiterate, I'm, what I'm trying to do is address what's been put, what I'm looking at, what we're, what the balance that I'm uh, left with and I'm trying to figure out a plan not just this balance but all of our balances to start paying them down getting them down to where they belong and then trying moving forward to make sure that we stay within those limits and I think that's the right direction to go into I think we need to clean the books and we need to have restrictions put here on how much comp time you use and it's to be used within that period of time it's just like any state employee or whatever you have comp time, you have to use it within a period of time. Council Spector. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think Councilor Tacey would say there was something in place already. I think that's why, Councilor, you've been referring to the contract. It's there. I, I do think, and I probably won't even say this as eloquently as, as Councilor Daniels did, but the, our choice here is really do if we I would imagine that any of the department heads that we're talking about and I think we're all upset by this but would say I would imagine they would say I really deserve this and it was it was signed off on and I think you really did a good job of saying well, how do we move with this now if we decide so our vote tonight is do we strike this from the budget and if we do I think we definitely would be faced with lawsuits because I would imagine all of the various not only this head would say look I put in all this time it was signed off on I let the mayor know I put in a ton of work and I deserve it and I would imagine we'd be looking at a lawsuit that would cost us at least this if not a lot more than that so the question is what are we going to do tonight on on this thing I think we're all assured that moving ahead we're not going to see the same issue happen 
The mayor has assured us he's moving on this. So I think that's really the question for tonight, which is, do we go ahead and strike this, looking at a lawsuit, making it a case, or not? I, for one, although I'm upset by this too, would approve of the $20,000 because I don't think it's worth it right now right. For, the, for the legal piece. And I am sure that you're going to be looking at this um, as, the, as we go on. I just want to be careful. I, I was not implying, I don't mean to imply that there would be a lawsuit. I'm just saying that. No, I am. I, I I, I, you didn't be, say that. I think but I would be. imagine, as I said, that I would imagine this department head and others feel that this is something they deserved. It was a practice at the time. And one of the things that happens is when there's a practice at the time, you go along with that practice. If it had been happening that people were not using the comp time within the allotted amount of time, but it seemed to be what everybody was doing, well, then it was up to somebody to not sign off on it. It was signed off on. Mm -hmm. These people, if I was in their position, I felt I did it even though my contract might have said it, well, it's what's happening. I would be upset if I come back and say, hey, this is what I thought I deserved. I, I'm glad we're going to be changing this. And, and I agree, I'm glad you brought this up, but I, I would like to move this forward and say, Look, for right now, I don't want to strike this from the line. I don't think it's worth making a case out of this. Um, and there, by the way, there, there is no motion. Yeah. So, so, just so we're clear, you know, we're debating a motion wants. that doesn't exist. Councilor Tacey. Yes. Yeah. I don't want anybody to, to lose the focus. The focus is outlined in the contract documentation. We want to know what the comp time is for. What is this for? Period. It's not our choice. Not a choice to make. It's a responsibility that we have to make. It is not, it is not the documentation, is not the requirement of the mayor's office. It is spelled out in the contract. The documentation is the requirement of the department head. If the department head cannot provide the documentation for this overtime, then as far as I'm concerned, it does not exist. That is the job of the department head. So I'll, and as far as the lawsuit goes, what would you sue us for? You could send us a bill for, for $21,000 and you're going to itemize it as you don't know? Okay, and I'll, I'll let it go. I don't want to beat the, the horse, but uh, animal rights activist, I'm sorry I said that. Uh, Councilor Freeman Daniels. That's a question for the mayor. Uh, of this, this 20986 um, could you tell me what percent of the comp time that, that the this department has accrued, that is? Uh, it's a two thirds of the of the um, the, the comp of that of that, that if that bulk of the comp time. It's the department, but it's one. It's, it's uh, yes, it's one individual. It's that department. Yeah, it's from the Council on Aging, but it's right. one individual. Yes. So, right, so it's not. It does not actually bring the whole balance down. But given the resources that we had, that was our our attempt to bring it down. Can I ask another question? <coughs> um, you've worked out with this individual this arrangement to pay to pay for comp time rather than to or is that is that just is that part of the contract that comp time can be discharged that way I, uh, I know this was discussed earlier I just I'm just not remembering in terms of uh, working it out I uh, we had a con we did have a conversation about trying to put in place a plan for begin to, to work beginning to work some of it down um, again um, as I think I may have discussed in the uh, in our budget hearings um, the level that the comp time is right now uh, would require this individual to take about half a year off in order to um, pay it out, to pay it off. Um, so that would, so that that's the challenge. So I think it's going to be, and this will be the same in other departments. It's going to be a combination of a pay, paying some of it down, but then also trying to work off parts of the balance as well. So we're going to be trying to address that um, uh, with the remaining balance. Um, so. Let me just say, I think I think we're stuck with the same question. It, se it seems to me, Council Tacey, you're mounting an, a case, right? It would be a, you know, legal case, a challenge to the comp time that's been that had been approved under the previous administration. Uh, and it, I think what you're, if you're effectively going to m move that this be struck from the from the uh, f the light item struck from the budget, you, you you'd have to convince the council. That, that we could win some sort of challenge for that comp time. Uh, and we, you'd also have to convince us that the legal cost would be lower than $30,000, which, you know, I, I'm, I'm agnostic about. Uh, I think it, you know. That I, was probably a bit, I, I, a little bit of hyperbole to say that it was, uh, you know, a, a 
twenty thousand dollar legal bill. I, I, well, I, I I, who knows what it would be? Yeah. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it seems like it seems like what you're telling us is that you think there's a there's a good case to be made that this comp time can be challenged and the city can avoid the liability that's incurred. And if I could just, in, if I could just, just, just quickly, just to say, just to sort of put this in context, you know, as I've studied all, tried to study all the collective bargaining agreements and have looked at different departments, and including my examination of the parking department, for example, there are countless examples of where contracts are not followed to the letter of the contract. And it happens on both sides, you know. They, and obviously, it's an agreement reached by two parties, and really, it, there's an understanding that the two parties are going to work to make sure that it's enforced. And there are aspects of contracts that just don't get enforced, and sort of by acquiescence by both parties, a practice is created. Um, and I'm, I see Councillor Ta uh, Councillor Carney nodding her head as our resident labor expert. Um, and so that's the situation. So I can say in the parking division, for example, there were uh, the hours of employees that did not match their contract, uh, what was required in their contract. There were lots of other things like that. And so I'm just, I'm just wanted to put in context, this is not like a isolated incident. It's something that does happen. We have really lengthy, detailed contracts. Um, and, and there are aspects of them that don't get followed to the letter. So. But undocumented hours has been a problem. Do we, do we know that they're undocumented? Uh, in terms of documentation, there's uh, documentation. Um, I mean, they may not When be someone any. fills out a time right. card that mm -hmm. they submit, uh, the one that goes to the auditor's office, there's a time card that's filled out that talks mm -hmm. about your regular work hours, comp time, overtime, et cetera. So, so it's it a very documented. basic. It's Well, it's documented, and obviously we hire department heads, and they Obviously, they sign that, so the, they are they're attesting that the folks in their department are working those hours. Right. Um, some departments have different internal mechanisms for tracking beyond that. You know, they may create internal worksheets or have different forms of, of ways of, of backup documentation. But in terms of what's required currently, uh, or that's that's the basic document that's required. And right, again, so I'm it is documented. The the in this department, the use of the comp time was every pay period listed as the number of hours that were accrued. That is correct. And, and so it is documented. You're right. And there's and tr the difference. I think the counselor Tazy has is is it is there detailed information? But if, but if we don't require details for the regular forty hours, uh, it. If that's not the practice in the department to re to require details of the 40, it would make sense it's not required to prov to provide details of the additional accrued time. Well, at least that's been the practice. And, right. And, and so I again I believe that we should uh, have better. Uh, and I'm working on a form that I'm going to be working with all departments to implement that will that weekly will, report the details. That will have that both more their detail on and their exactly. time. and providing the actual dates and et cetera right. and r rat reasons. And, and again, I, I want to be careful. I don't want to paint uh, all city departments with a broad brush because we have many departments that do have these kinds of controls. I, you know, the police department is a model in this regard. They have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if a detective has to stay an extra time to work on a case, there's a whole sign-off procedure that he has to get signed and countersigned by the command structure in order to authorize that. Mm -hmm. So there are, you know, so. For example, in your own department, do you require folks to list out all of the duties that they accomplished in the 40 hours? Uh, we do not. Um, okay. uh, yeah, we do not. Um, we I, we don't take comp time in my department, but um, and I certainly don't. But uh, <laughs> uh, and um, but but yeah. So yeah, that is the exactly the we prepare the payroll. People work the hours that they're expected, and I'm the supervisor of the office, and I attest that they have worked those hours. Yeah. And what we're talking about is a practice that was common and. Um, was prevailing under the previous 12 years of uh, previous administration, if not longer. Mm -hmm. Okay, and and you're, what you're saying is that you're taking a different tack and looking for some more specificity to address what you hear are concerns or that you are concerned with yourself. That's correct. Okay. And I don't know why we're belaboring this. I know you've asked us not to belabor, and you're asking for further documents. Mm -hmm. 
uh, Councillor, but I don't know that there are, you know, it's, it should be expected that there would be further documentation than that was, which was common for the past 12 years. Well, or 16 or 20 or 60. Excuse me, I, and, and uh, because he was asked a direct question. Okay. Um, but it, and I ask you all to wait to be assigned to the floor before you you speak up. So, Councilor Tacey, you may answer the question. Yeah. Thank you. I went to the other departments in the city of Northampton, and I asked them about their comp time over the years. And I went to the Department of Public Works, and when I asked Mr. Huntley what John Doe did for his comp time in June of 2010, he tells me exactly what the comp time was for, mm -hmm. not just number and it says in the contract that they will keep those records the department heads so it is not like I said it's not the duty of the mayor uh, or the mayor's office to keep track of this but it says in here that these records will be made available to human resources or the auditors department upon request so when request these and they don't have any documentation for the time work well, that's and if you could if I could find out in up to the check date 1004 207 how there's 83 hours of comp time there's 70 hours of work and 83 hours of comp time or the following pay 69 and a quarter hours you work a 70 hour week and then you're going to and then 80 or excuse me 35 hour week and then get 45 hours of comp time mm -hmm. uh I'd just like somebody to explain that to me. I'd like to see the documentation, where that is from. And then how is it that you can do, um, make, uh, earn 40 hours of comp time and use 18 hours of comp time in the same pay period? No, That's I, just my question. I've, so if somebody could show me this, I, I'd be happy. I've, I've, I've actually allowed you to address the question, and now Councilor Spector. Yeah, is I, I'm getting uncomfortable. With the I am too. And part of the reason I've sat here for years where Certain department heads that we're talking about have come here, and we know they've put in extra 40 hours. Com um, we were just looking at a letter to the editor where it was talking about this person being scapegoated by us, and I want to make sure that isn't what's happening here, because there's an undertone here that if she had only documented this, but there's a mistrust of the time, and I don't think that is the issue here. The issue here was that policies weren't put in place rather than attack this individual because we've sat here and said we've known that this department had put in, especially when they were building the new building and you go over there, this person was working an extra 20, 25 hours a week. The issue is not about this individual or this individual not documenting it. There was a practice in place for a lot of years. We're changing that practice. The question right now, it's, it's not a question on the floor, but I'd like to move away from this. I think we've gone over and over it. We're going to put new policies in place. And the longer we keep going back on this, I think it becomes a personal attack on one person. And that I'm not comfortable with. I just, I just would like to also just add more as just to keep it in context. There are actually eight, there are eight NAPIA employees who, have a who are above the 40-hour balance. So exactly. it's not one that has exceeded it. Um, obvious, yeah. So. And we're, but we're trying to work on the largest balances and with the resources that we have. Council Murphy and then Council LeBar. I'd, I would actually like to call first reading on this question. There's two weeks between now and second reading for those concerned to do further research and, uh, and, and, and satisfy themselves with this. But I think it's time to vote on first reading. If, if I may ask for an opportunity to pass a gavel because, you know, I've been sitting here chewing my tongue and I'm yes. frustrated with my status here as being the guy who shuts up. Yes. Um, may, may, would, 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 I'd be glad to sit <laughs> in your chair. <laughs> well, I, uh, if I could pass a gavel, I believe, to Council LaBarge, who, who stands as senior. Yeah, you have to pass that to somebody who hasn't spoken on the issue. Or <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I, and I don't think you I'd just like to say that, that I, I, um, you know, we've, we've passed around a lot of thanks, but uh, I think the thank uh, the citizens of Northampton is kind of critical, too. Because what we were doing right now is soliciting them to subsidize this budget. The term approval really makes me uncomfortable. I am going to approve this budget. I don't approve of the fact that we are in this situation. We, we're discussing $20,000 here right now. The state's uh, commitment to us has been reduced by $3.35 million over the last five years. This is a $75 million budget. And the $20,000, hopefully, we get this settled, but it won't mean a jot to the circumstances. I think the, the outrage that everyone is expressing and the concern 
is too finely focused. I think <laughs> we, we actually, I will approve this budget with an aspect of shame. I will be ashamed. And I've, I've written to a number of people who have written to me as well that, that by way of explanation, we are the point of sale here for a profoundly dysfunctional system that we abide, that we have continued to abide. Councilor Schwartz has spoken on this very eloquently. She sent out a letter that was, that was really heartening because it brings the focus back to where it is. We're, we, in our infinite wisdom, decided to diminish taxes on income and then thinking that we had cut taxes when point in fact we've passed on the responsibility in a variety of jerry-rigged fees and, and enterprise funds and, and circus systems that require a lot of spinning plates. And it's not, it's, it is, we've been charged with this and in fact, when we make these resolutions that were, were that people take uh, criticism with us about talking about larger national issues, this is where it manifests itself. When we allow, for instance, the priorities to be established to subsidize three wars, and, and then we are fighting over $20,000. We're fighting over $20,000 because not because the people here made the wrong choices or, or not because the people here worked on the right priorities. It's because forces beyond us, forces that we endorse by our votes, by our, our approval, those are the forces that put us in this situation. So I, I actually vote yes for this budget. I say yes, thank you very much to Susan and David. I think the, the task that you've been charged with is one that I would never, mm -hmm. ever consider doing. And what you guys did was elegant, thoughtful, conscientious, and noble service. And I resent the fact that you were put in the position that you were put in. I resent the fact that we're in the position that we're put. I resent the fact that going back even before Councilor Spector was voting for his nine budgets, I was voting for budgets too. And every one of them was a death of a thousand cuts. Sure was. Literally. Our priorities here in this community are dictated by the resources that we're left with. And the resources that we're left with are the leavings and the trailings of money invested and determined and the priorities that have been determined by profit centers, people more intent on generating profit than trying to subsidize human endeavor and human existence. Grand, grandiose sens sensibilities. But point of fact, I want everyone to know, everyone who ever voted for me, everyone who ever sent me a nasty letter or, or an unidentified voicemail, I want you all to know that these are, this is what has been wrought and this is what will continue to be wrought. And instead of fighting and quibbling over small incremental departmental issues about cross-training or, or subsidizing uh, uh, reserve receipts for ambulance funds, we should be talking about our aspirations. And we are denied that because we buy into a, 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 a broken system. So. I hope you will join with me and Councilor Schwartz and other councilors as we continue to rail against this. And also remember there's a ballot initiative that will be coming up in the next election mm -hmm. that will offer you the opportunity to vote for a progressive income tax. A progressive income tax based on your ability to pay as opposed to forcing regressive tax systems like property tax systems, fees on, on services like water and sewer. This is not based on your ability to pay. This is based on usage, and it, and it destroys the middle class, it destroys communities, and it creates the, this horrible, the, these horrible grudge matches that develop. So um, that's kind of a rant, but it's also by way of saying I am enormously grateful to the citizens of Northampton and the mayor and Susan Wright, uh, yeoman's work, and I will vote yay, but it won't, rec it won't be an acknowledgment of approval. Are there any other questions or comments on this portion of the budget? Councilor Murphy, you were moving. I'm still where I was. God. <laughs> <laughs> Same place I was pre-rant. Point of order, Chair, I think sure. you passed the, the, the gavel. Yes. Here. Oh, I, and, thank you very much. Uh, 
I think that uh, counselor, the counselor from Ward 6 should keep it. <laughs> I've got Robert's rules loaded if you want to challenge me. <laughs> no, I have no problem. You think she should keep it because? Because um, your partisanship has been declared. Yes. Yeah. But he passed it to somebody that had partisanship also, which is illegal. I know. I, that's totally what I said. Partisan, I'll take it. I think Councilor Murphy is the, the only person who hasn't spoken on that. All I did was move the question. <laughs> yeah, you get to well, get well, You want to gavel? I think he needs hey, it. You're fine. Hey. Maybe. <laughs> hey, I just wanted to say your rules specify that when the council president is presiding, uh, he or she Can. has all of its full of powers. the body. The powers of the body. Of the, exactly. Yeah, you're, still, you're still a counselor. So One point in fact, actually, we're still going to be trying to override Robert's rules. Yeah. Yeah. So you're still. Well, I. I you're still in charge. I, I just look, but I just I, I fear there'll be a, a, a hot gavel. potato action going here with the gavel. Well, in in so far as the council Murphy has not expressed his intent on the vote, uh, I would be f comfortable with the gavel so he could preside over the vote. If, it, if do any toss it, take it. it. <laughs> Go. Vote. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Okay, so it was my. Rec <laughs> I think oh. that, that, yeah, yeah, you retain voting privileges. Any yes. anyone with the gavel retains right. voting privileges. Yes. But it was my uh, my calling of the question pre possession of the gavel. So is, is anyone interested in calling the question? Uh, you're calling a question, sir. Yes. All, All second. Right. Call the question. Uh, point of information: This has to be done as a roll call vote. Yep. And in first reading, Mary, would you call the roll in first reading? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Barge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Stackett? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Yes. Yes. Unanimous in first reading. And with that, I return the gavel to the Council President. <laughs> I was trying to tell you. <laughs> that's, just a, that's just the first one. Yeah. Yeah. So. <laughs> Everyone keep up for the rest of the evening? Could we have a break? Actually, before we would take a break, do would those of you indulge taking the water, sewer, and solid waste enterprise funds as a group? Yes. Not to relieve the council president of reading them, but that we would then move them as a group? Yeah. Seeing that they're all enterprise funds? Yes. yes. All right. Can I ask for a recess? Uh, the request was made to do this before the recess. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I think oh, you just wanted to know I, whether I, we I, will take I think we should recess. The Council Freeman Daniels anticipates a debate that might prolong the urgency for a recess. Well, then I would acquiesce to a recess now. Yes. Why don't we, we're going to recess for five minutes, and when we return, we'll, we will Sorry. take. Stop looking like that. <laughs>
Sir. Welcome back to the Northampton City Council. As you can see, I'm Councillor David Murphy, and it appears I'm maintaining the chair for at least the foreseeable future. <laughs> we are still discussing uh, the Northampton City budget, and I'm, I'm going to propose uh, that we take the three enterprise funds from DPW, the water, the sewer, and the solid waste as a group. Is so moved. Any... Second. All, right, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right, so I'm going to read the totals of them and then open them for discussion. Um, the sewer enterprise budget amount is $5,517,720. The water enterprise budget amount is $7,100,000. And 63,210, and the solid waste enterprise fund budget total is 3,764,287. So we'll open that for discussion. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, the, we, it's been Sewer, moved. Second. It's been water, moved. Second. It's been solid waste. Any discussion on any of these enterprise funds? Oh. I'll just yeah. make a comment. Um, you know, the, the funds fund are funded through fees, uh, user fees, and um, you know, the city council does not approve the fees. Uh, so, you know, the only possible uh, approach the city council could have would be cutting these, bu cutting the budgets, that thus making it so the fees collected would could not be spent. But um, each enterprise fund does have significant uh, projects that it has to undertake either by mandate or just simply by um, priority. So I just do not believe it's responsible to cut any of these budgets despite the fee increase. So I will vote aye on all three. Uh, um, to that point, also a little bit to my rant, um, enterprise funds actually more or less historically were established because of the strictures from Proposition 2 and a half, the fact that you were not able to generate revenue from the community to pay for these things. Enterprise funds were established to be a de facto tax, as Councilor Freeman Daniels alluded to. Um, it, they're called fees, and they are critical. And it's it's going to become even more critical, as you've heard, uh, you know, the 9% increase, the projected $100 million uh, project caseload that we're, the, the Department of Public Works is about to assume that yeah, there's a story in uh, both papers today. The and 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 just more to a philosophical point, this is my this is the thing that drives me crazy because it's very appropriate to have a funding system and a funding pool that has dedicated to these particular issues. But the fact is, is that it does create this greater layer of separation from the citizens' input on on increases. Um, now, a lot of these projects are mandated. We don't really get much of a choice. The federal and state government mandate a lot of these projects. And then, of course, we expect um, some state offsets and federal government offsets, but they've been, on, as we noted, regularly reduced. All in the name of saying that we're reducing taxes. In point of fact, you're not reducing taxes. It's not like the problems went away and everything got fixed and everything runs. We've created a clever system in order to collect taxes, and it's a regressive system. Water use is not based on people's ability to pay. A family of five with a single mother is going to be paying more for water usage than a family of two that, that make uh, $450,000 a year, paying much less. I mean, they'll be paying much more than the, that family. It's a usage fee, and it is not fair or equitable, and I, and I want and I just want people to understand that we vote for these things and we approve them because these are the handcuffs that we work within. But it, when everyone screams about these things, they have to know that this, we have, as I said, a dysfunctional system. And I would argue further that lobbying for uh, change doesn't mean small, you know, referenda which call for even more tax decreases or building a casino somewhere that's going to make this magically fix or increasing the lottery funds which is also another aggressive tax based on aspirations hopes of people who don't have money and exploiting them we have to push for an understanding that a progressive tax tax on your income based on your ability to pay requiring the wealthy to subsidize their fair share and it is a fair share they're paying far less than their fair share and that includes corporations even though they enjoy the rights of human beings in this country 
as such, I hope that they would also bear the responsibility of human beings and the every, everyday citizens in this country. That's the end of that rant. Thank you very much. <laughs> so does anyone else have any more comments in first reading on water, sewer, and solid waste <laughs> enterprise? <laughs> Councilor Tase. Yeah, um, I think uh, a lot of the, the outrage on the, the rates, mm -hmm. he says, um, you really achieve legitimacy through your public participation. When you bring the public and you involve the community in the, when you have hearings and not just to raise it by whatever it is, because if the public doesn't know why you're raising it, they get upset and they were furious at the last rate hikes. So I would just like to see that we, I, I intend to approve and vote yes on this, but you do achieve a, a sense of legitimacy through your public participation and people need to be involved in this. And uh, I'll stop at that. Councilor Barge. Yes, um, I will support all three of the enterprises, but I did have concerns, and Councilor Tacey did bring this up. And it was over the article that was placed in the Gazette, which none of us knew it was happening, at the 9% increase in the SOAR and water rates. I really feel that communication is very, very valuable, and especially to the public and our taxpayers. I think if there was an open public hearing that was put in place at seven o'clock at night, not at four, not at five, to educate the public of exactly what is happening here and the reasons why there was going to be an increase, to just put it in the paper, not know nothing about it, you are going to get an outcry. And I am hoping now that we look at this very, very carefully with our departments, that when something is extremely crucial as going up 9% on the sewer and water rates, that these open public hearings are being put in place. It's what you call educating the public and working together and letting the public know what needs to be done. And I still feel that some way us counselors need to put an ordinance in place of yes we would have some control to be able to make a compromise not at nine percent maybe drop it down lower to just say this is it this is the way it's going to be i don't operate that way as a counselor and i'm uncomfortable with it so i'm hoping that eventually we can look at doing an ordinance further comment Seeing none, I'd ask Mary to call the roll in first reading on the water, sewer, and the solid waste enterprise funds. Councilor Boyd? Yes. Councilor Freeman Daniels? Aye. Councilor Lavarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Schwartz? Yes. Councilor Stacey? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Carries unanimously. So next we have 18 different revolving funds. And I would propose that we take those as a group. So I'm going to read them each individually to identify what they are for those watching at home and for all of you here. Um, is there a motion to take the 18 as a group? Make so a motion. Second. Um, the first one is the fire department enterprise fund in the amount of $200,000. The fire department generates revenue through fees false alarm, charges, permits, and other fire department activities. The City Council, in accordance with Mass General Law 40, Chapter 44, Section 53E and a half, may authorize the establishment of a revolving fund for the fire department for FY13 in support of department activities. Um, some of the things that they're authorized for, uh, the expenditures may be made for the support of fire department, including salaries, employee benefits, and other expenses, which the fire committee or, or public safety, in this case, or the fire chief may appropriate. So that one is for $200,000. The next one um, is the fire department hazmat revolving fund. It's for $65,000. That is also established under Chapter 44, Section 53 E and a half. 
uh, it authorizes the creation of the fund for 2013. Expenditures may be made for the support of hazmat programs, including purchase or replacement of materials, equipment, protective gear, vehicle repair, maintenance, preparedness training activities, and for any purpose in connection with the hazmat program, which the Public Safety Committee or the Fire Chief may appropriate. Uh, the next one is the Department of Public Works Construction Services Revolving Fund in the amount of $85,000. That is authorized under, uh, as the other ones were, Chapter 44, Section 53 E and a half, uh, and would authorize a revolving fund for the Department of Public Works for FY13 for the operation of construction services. Um, this one uh, can be used for as the other ones are, department personnel um, and can also be carried over into 2014 uh, the funds, if the fund is reauthorized by the council next year. All right, and that's for $85,000. Um, the next one is the Cross Connection Program Revolving Fund. This one as well is authorized under Chapter 44, Chapter 44 Section 53 and a half. Um, and this is for the Department of Public Works for the operation of the cross-connection program. Again, the total amount for that uh, was, I think I said, uh, $75,000. And this is in support and expansion of the cross-connection program, including but not limited to purchase of equipment, materials, training costs, fees for certification, and licenses needed in connection with the program technical or other consultant services, uh, and that's the cross-connection fund. The next one is the uh, Tourism Directional Sign Program Revolving Fund for $20,000. Uh, again, Chapter 44, Section 53 and a half for 2013. Um, re receipts for this, if everyone remembers this, this is the, the uh, locational signs. Um, if we don't expend the funds in 13 and carry it over to 14, we can use them there. Support for work of the tourism directional sign program include, but are not limited to, materials, supplies, equipment, and labor for the erection and maintenance of s directional signs in the city. And again, that's for $20,000. The next one is the transportation revolving fund for $70,000. Again, chapter 40 44. 53 and a half. Uh, receipts received but not expended again can be used in the next year if it's authorized again. Expenditure may be made for the acquisition, vehicle repair, maintenance, gasoline mileage, reimbursements, contract services, salary stipends, and other expenses direct, directly related to the operation of transportation services by the Council on Aging. And again, uh, the total for the transportation revolving fund is $70,000. Uh, the next one, Council on Aging Activities Revolving Fund, it is for a total of $90,000. Again, the same chapter and section authorize it. Uh, expenditures may be made uh, to pay for Council on Aging programs, activities, and services, including salaries, stipends, and employee benefits. And again, uh, the Transportation Fund is for $70,000. The next one would be, um, or I'm sorry, that was, uh, I believe, the activities. That was the activities fund. So. The next one is the gift shop revolving fund for $40,000, same section and chapter. Uh, and expenditures may be made to pay for gift shop fixtures, merchandise, sales tax, contracts and services, and services including salaries, stipends, and employee benefits. So again, that's the gift shop revolving fund for $40,000. Again, from the Council on Aging, the food services revolving fund uh, of $50,000, same chapter and section. Um, expenditures may be made for the acquisition of kitchen equipment and supplies, meals, meals taxes, food, contracted services, salary stipends, employee benefits, and other expenses directly related to the operation of the food service program by the Northampton Council on Aging. Uh, the next one is the one that was most recently cr created for the Committee on Disabilities. It's a $7,000 revolving fund, again, same chapter and section. 
uh, expenditures may be made for the following purposes, support work for the initiatives of the Committee on Disabilities, including but not limited to lending resource library, printed materials in large print and braille, handicap signage, printing of access in Northampton booklets, the website, oversight, um, purchase of ADA regulation booklets and materials, training costs, educational programs, consultants, and, uh, and publicly in in public information materials such as brochures, posters, or informational mailings. And I, I believe, Councillor Barge, isn't that the one that's funded from the handicap parking violations? Yes. Um, what we did last year, um, Councillor Tacey and I worked on it, and he did a lot of research. And I saw that it had stated 7000 on it, and I called Susan Wright, our financial director, because last year, the order was put in place for 5,000 and I saw an increase on this one for 7,000. So um, Susan explained to me the reasons why she had highly suggested to the director that we go up a couple of more thousand so it's now 7,000 instead of the five. All right, the next one is the Recreation Department Athletic League B revolving fund it's for a total of $230,000, again, authorized by the same chapter and section. Expenditures may be made to pay salaries, employee benefits, expenses, and contracted services required to operate athletic leagues for city residents supervised directly by the Recreation Department. And um, again, that's for $230,000. It's the Rec Department Athletic League Revolving Fund. The next one is the Kennedy School Aquatic Center Revolving Fund for $120,000. I'm going to stop reading. the. They're all the same chapter and uh, section authorization. Uh, receipts received but not expended, again, can be carried over into the next year. Uh, the Director of Recreation Department shall be authorized to expend from the fund for stated purposes. No further appropriations shall be required, provided, however, that no expenditure shall be made in excess of the balance of the fund, nor shall total expenditures for the fiscal year exceed the sum of $120,000, which is the total of that one. Uh, the next one is the Northampton School Department Transportation Revolving Fund for $175,000. Um, to do expenditures may be made to tran for transportation expenses and contract services required to operate a transportation system maintained directly by the Northampton School Department. And that's for $75,000. The next 100, one, 100, or $175,000, I'm sorry, $175,000 total. Um, the next one is the Smith Vocational and Agricultural High School Farm Revolving Fund that totals $200,000. Uh, and in this one, expenditures may be made to pay salaries, employee benefits, vehicle repair, maintenance, gasoline expenses, and contracts <coughs> directly related to the operation. Um, and that is the Smith Vocational High School Farm Revolving Fund for $200,000. The next one is the Public Health Nursing Program Revolving Fund that totals $5,000. Expenditures may be made for the following purposes, support for the work of the public health nursing program, including but not limited to the purchase of vaccines and other pharmaceuticals, medical office equipment, professional development, continuing education for nursing staff, contract staff that's associated with the outreach program from the, uh, the nurse's office. And again, that's for $5,000. Mr. Chairman? Uh, Mr. Chairman? Yes. I have uh, 2500 I think, in the... In the original budget, is that right? Um, I have to ask. Susan. Not to ex not to exceed. Not to not exceed. To exceed. Yeah. Yeah. We, we had originally done twenty five hundred and increased it before it was last voted to five. Yeah. So. so in the original budget, so this is a change. Was five, and this is going to be five. This mm -hmm. is okay. You have to repeat time. that because it wasn't on television. Oh, you weren't far enough. All right, so the it was at one point twenty five hundred dollars. It was increased to five thousand dollars. In the final version of the budget, go, go to the microphone. <laughs> oh yeah, why don't you just come over to the podium and then I won't have to translate for you. This is a new one that we established this year, and 
in my computer I had 2,500, but when it actually came to you, we decided to do five. So this, the book should have represented five, and that's why it's corrected in this order, in the mm -hmm. actual order to be five. All right. Is everybody comfortable yeah. with yep. Yep. where that came from? Can Thank you. you. Go through that social services, 5,000? Yes. Okay. Thank you. The next one is the Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund. It totals $75,000. And uh, expenditures may be made to pay materials, expenses, and contract services associated with the projects, programs, and policies that increase the level of energy efficiency and energy resource sustainability and guard against effects of energy resource disruption, depletion, depletion and climate change in all of Northampton's public and private sectors. That would be municipal business, commercial, residential, agricultural, and institutional, consistent with the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, and that one's for $75,000. And, uh, and then the James House Revolving Fund for $75,000. Uh, and um, this is used for maintenance of the property, including but not limited to salaries, employee benefits, equipment supplies, materials, repairs, utilities, plowing, landscaping, capital expenditures, printing, advertising, signage, and other costs, debt service for loans, bonds, uh, issued for the renovation of the James House. And that, I believe, there, there's one last transfer, but I think that's all of um, you got one more? Okay. That's not All right. So we'll open those for discussion. <laughs> Any discussion on revolving funds? I just wanted to add, the Mayor. The last James House one is actually a brand new one. Um, we discussed it in the Finance Committee, but that's a brand yes. new revolving. So it's not one that's being renewed, but it's a brand new one. And it's essentially we're trying to now create kind of a cost center for the James House so that all of the fund maintenance and all the other uh, rents and everything. 14. So that's, just wanted to point that out as a new one. Okay. So all of the other ones are reauthorizations. Yeah, Every one of them. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, they've been around before. Yep. yep. All right. Any further discussion about any of those revolving funds? Councilor Barsh. Yes. Um, I know I had several questions and I've been working very closely with Susan Wright was on the DPW Cross Connection Program Revolving Fund. And she explained to me about this fund that it's specifically to manage backflow prevention. And looking at it, it really, it didn't explain it thoroughly. And she did have Ned email back and I understand what was occurring there and the amount of money that was being asked for that revolving fund. So thank you, Susan. So any further discussion on the revolving funds? Hearing none, I will ask Mary to call the roll on the revolving fund. Superintendent Daniels? Aye. Councilor Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. Councilor Yes. 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 Unanimously passed. Thank you. So the next thing we have is a financial order transferring $32,470 from Energy Reinvestment Revolving Fund to Energy and Sustainability Revolving Fund. Point of information. I think, I think actually at this point, do you want? Can, yeah, I, I, I was think. I going to resume the chair after right. the budget. Exactly. Right. So, so if you'd like to. <laughs> well, you're well. I'm I'm happy, always happy to relinquish the chair back to the mayor. So, as long as I can take my agenda. <laughs> Come on, you wanted it. You got covered it that gavel. <laughs> okay, so. Um, Good job, by the way. Good job, David. Moving from the consideration of the budget, we do have a couple of we have. Uh, financial orders to deal with. Um, the first is upon the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee, ordered that the city council transfer from the energy reinvestment revolving fund, fund 2418, to the energy and sustainability revolving fund, fund 2420, the balance of $32,470. Move to approve. Second it. Is there any discussion or questions about this? Discussed in finance. Hearing none, 
All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. It's okay. Okay, the next item is uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor and the finance committee order that the city council appropriate $23,000 to the FY 2012 Central Services Custodial Supplies account for the purpose of equipping the new police station with custodial maintenance equipment and to meet that appropriation transfer the balance of $3,192 from the receipts reserved for appropriation at Wood Drive, transfer the balance of $3,000 from the receipts reserved for appropriation innovative enterprise and transfer sixteen thousand eight hundred and eight dollars from the undesignated fund balance move to approve second is there any discussion on this one hearing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. um move to suspend rules for second reading okay there's been a motion to suspend second rules and there's been seconded all those in favor of suspending rules say aye. Aye. aye aye opposed okay rules are suspended i would entertain a motion on second reading so moved second it so again, this is on the question of the $23,000 appropriation for the custodial equipment for the police station. Any discussion on second reading? Hearing none. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, thank you very much on that one. Okay. So that comes the financial orders will now move into ordinances. Um, so oh, don't we have to do CPC? No, we did that. We, we did them. Uh, not as a whole. Didn't we just do it in finance? Actually, we did. We moved them up before oh, the budget. Yeah. Oh. We did. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. So now we have ordinances, uh, and I want to be. Oh. So this is um, this is a first reading uh, on an ordinance to amend section 312-36, and the first reading was postponed um, from April 5th, 2012. Move to table indefinitely. Okay. Second. 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 Made, uh, postpone indefinitely or table indefinitely. Postponed. postponed. Sorry, we've been through that. And seconded. Um, no debate. There's no debate. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Any abstention. Okay. So that is postponed indefinitely. Um, the next order is an uh, for referral to committees. Thirty-six. Um, and actually. Uh, Okay, 312 uh, 36 parking meter locations and regulations and for referral to committee. Make sure they're all signed. Yeah. Actually, could you, could you take all three? Can we take all three referrals as a group? Okay. Just going out. We can. Yep. Um, and, uh, and then we have some late files as well. Uh, but we can take those as uh, to suspend rules. So there's actually several oh, they um, parking uh, amendments. Uh, uh, two that amends uh, section 312-36, one that amends section 312-33, one that amends section 312-109, and one that uh, amends section 312-110. The only thing I want to be Late, huh? clear about is some of them have come from the Transportation and Parking Commission. Okay, but the those other are the light files. Okay, the great. So the other okay, those are the, I just want to so, make sure we weren't mixing and matching. Right. So 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 moved. Um, I would entertain a move, motion to where they will be referred. Move for approval this. to transportation parking and ordinance. Okay. Second. Second. Okay. Any uh, discussion of that? All those in favor of referring say aye. 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 Okay. Opposed? Okay, those are referred. Um, we also have some late file ordinances. Uh, and uh, I would um, First, seek a suspension of Rule 38. So moved. Second it. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. So uh, before you, uh, for purposes of referral, I have ordinances recommended by the Transportation and Parking Commission and 312-36, 312-109, and 312-110. And I would entertain a motion to refer those. Move to transportation and parking and also ordinance. Okay, there's a motion made. Is there? I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion made and seconded. Councilor? This was recommended from transportation and parking. So I would 
like to amend that to strike the mo the referral to TPC and just refer it to ordinance. Second. Second. Yeah. Okay. Yes, he's right. Okay. So there's been a motion uh, made to refer to the ordinance committee. Uh, and is there a, and there's been seconded, is there any further discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And the, okay, just want to get back to the original agenda here. Okay, so we've completed the ordinances. Are there any updates from the council president? Uh, one to reiterate, the next council meeting will be convening on the 21st at 7 o'clock at JFK Middle School. Uh, please be sure to pass that on to your constituents and to anyone paying attention on at home. Uh, also, uh, and there will be uh, a hearing at 8 o'clock on June 21st at that meeting uh, for a poll petition of Chesterfield Road by National. Okay. Uh, is there any new business? Okay, hearing none, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The meeting is adjourned.